Actually, the Latin etymology, the, the root of the word, to impress somebody literally means to impress, like to put an indentation on something. So I think with photography too, it's the same thing as that. You're trying to impress them by impacting, leaving a mark on their heart or their soul. You essentially want to make memorable photos that actually impact, that change, that transform your viewer somehow. And it's tricky to say it because generally when people say, oh, you know, I want to impress Chow Yu with my photos, right? Most people interpret impress as I want to show off or I want to look good, right? But I think what it really is is that you're trying to leave an, an emotional impact or an emotional impression on your viewer. And the first, for, uh, foremost tip is you got to make sure that you're impacted by your own pictures. And this is why I like to let my photos marinate for a while. Does so anyone here cook? Right? If I'm cooking a nice steak, do I just take the steak out of the freezer and just throw it on the pan? No. What are you, what are you supposed to do, dude? Room temperature. Room temperature? Yeah. And then how do you marinate it? Salt and pepper. That's it. More, it's like post-processing, right? Simpler the better, right? Um, anyone here like to drink wine? <laughs> so what are you supposed to do with a nice wine? Uh, you agree with them. You agree, right? Um, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you supposed to go boop and then go boop, boop, boop? Depends on the time. <laughs> Depends on the situation. Right? Generally, according to my snobby friends, uh, the longer you let the wine breathe, the longer you let it age, the better it tastes. So I think in photography, it's the same thing too, is that Photos that once impressed me or impacted me, that I shot like five years ago, I look at it now, I'm like, what was that thing? Or like, it no longer has the emotional impact on me. But there's actually certain photos that I shot 10 years ago that still impact me emotionally. I'm like, that's a really good picture. So ultimately, the best guide for your photos is actually time and actually the emotional impact. So in photography, I think this is why it's good to often revisit your older pictures in your portfolio. And this is also something you guys can think about yourselves as photographers. Right? You guys can write this down. Dynamic portfolio. So the concept of a dynamic portfolio is this. Um, in the days of film or old school photography, you had a portfolio. And that's what showed your worth as a as artist. So you remember you have to carry around those little stupid like, little thingies and you go show up people. Now we have the internet and Facebook, Instagram and whatever, right? The reason I like a dynamic portfolio is that because of digital technology and photography and everything, your portfolio is always changing and evolving. So what I used to think was you had to work really, really hard as a photographer and then you have this ultimate portfolio that's set in stone that will last for a millennium. I think that's silly. My suggestion is a dynamic portfolio that almost on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a yearly basis, you can constantly add new pictures to your portfolio and also constantly remove pictures or even change the order of pictures or if you're working on different projects, certain projects that you think are really good, keep them on your portfolio page and projects you think are weaker end up removing and calling them. So it's kind of nice because dynamic means it's not static. And it means that you allow yourself to grow. Because let's say 10 years from now, you don't like street photography anymore. You like flower photography. Then maybe it's a good idea that you actually change up your portfolio and only show your flower pictures. So once again, it's kind of like allowing yourself not to become the prisoner of a job. As I yeah. is, um, Okay, we just went to this really good talk yesterday. So there's this concept of um, a pie model student, but I think this could actually be applied to photography too. So this is my concept. Okay. So do we all know, do you all remember the symbol for pi? Yeah. Right? So I'll just, I'll just show you guys on the, the screen. So all right, so you guys are curious, this is the app called Procreate. So Procreate. So do you guys, do you guys remember pi? 
So 3.14. What's the line? Let's have some more digits. We took 3.14 what? 159. 152. Okay, anyways. I'm an Asian bad about that. So the basic concept is this is that um, you have broad domain expertise. So it means like for example, you're really into like painting, photography. Uh, graphic design, computer programming, dance, theater, blah, 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 right? Ice cream. Ice cream, yes. And in certain aspects, you have a very strong, deep domain expertise. So for example, for me, this is like street photography, or photography. And this is actually the next thing here, is that like this, is that this is like your aesthetic or elegance is that you do this in some sort of a, um, you know what your artistic taste is and you do it in an elegant way. So however you just define elegant is, is up to you. But practical tips is for example, if you want to become a fully formed artist, you want to be like Leonardo da Vinci. He was not only a painter, but he was also an engineer. Raise your hand if you're engineering or the sciences. Cool. So I'm actually trying to teach myself more engineering computer science. I've been studying physics for fun. And so the basic idea is if you want to become the most ultimate artist, don't just limit yourself to the photographic ghetto. Allow yourself to form, study all forms of art, poetry, theater, dance, engineering, whatever. So even what I do in my free time is... Um, <laughs> so mind, mind, mind you that I study... Raise your hand if you studied humanities in school, like sociology or whatever. Like, so I was an Asian kid bad at math. And do you know what I do for my fun time? I do shit like this. And the way I do this is, I have friends who are mathematicians who study differential equations. And then when I'm bored, I just literally sketch these composition lines for fun, as a way of seeing more artistically. And even other random things I've been doing too, is that I've been studying uh, sculpture. So you import in and this picture, and space. then you... Sketch on top of it, yeah. So do you guys, any of you guys know this piece? You need yeah. continuity in space. So tell us about this. Why is it a big deal? Or what do you like about it? Uh, well, it was part of this Italian move, uh, kind of movement in the early 20th century around, it's sort of like the generalization of kind of expressionism in these forms. I don't know, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't have a better Yeah, 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 no, so, so very, very good. So I think that Italians are the most advanced race. <laughs> Shout out to Fabio. I wish I was Italian. I actually have an Italian uncle. His name is Enzo Di Tullio. True story. So, essentially, for fun, I like to sketch sculpture too because the, the concept of the sculpture is this: is that how do you make a sculpture that's static, it's not moving, but make it look like it's moving? And essentially, the way I do is in my iPad. I just have the photos out, right? Whenever I see things which are interesting to me, I'll just do the screenshot function and then I'll just sketch on top of it to better understand compositions, shapes and forms. And I allow myself to do everything for fun. And um, even some things you guys might like is, uh, you could, and this is why it's so cool, you could discover art anywhere. Like this is um, sketches from the uh, Iliad even looking at ancient Greek pottery. I'm like teaching myself algorithms right now and stuff like that too. Because there's some sort of like beauty that undermines all of it. I watch, and you guys watch the AlphaGo documentary? Um, so there's so many different forms and I'm also studying uh, computer vision right now. So just seeing how computers see the world and all this crazy shit. So the way, essentially, I, I'll just give you guys a very, very brief tutorial. So simple ways you could do it. So like, these are some pictures of Salvador Dali. 
that I sketched on top of, which I really like. Essentially, the way that you could, you could do this on your iPhone or iPad or whatever, you could just push the power button and the home button at the same time. Snap. And then in the bottom left corner, it opens up the sketching tool, and then you could just sketch the composition or the leading lines on top of it. And you just click save. So that's one option. Another option, one thing I like to do is, so like let's say I'm looking at some Renaissance painting and I'm trying to draw sketches and try to understand why the compositions work or whatever. What I might just do is I'll take a picture. So Procreate, if you have it on I, iPad and iPhone, um, you can see it here, but in the top right corner there is the share button. Click that, click add to Procreate. Send it to Procreate, and then I'll open up the Procreate app, go to the gallery, and automatically it should show up here. So you show the picture. And then top right here, you just choose different colors. And generally what I like to do is, I click the Layers button here. I'll add a new layer. And then I'll just draw the compositions, shapes, and forms that I really like. And this is the nice thing with sketching, is that the more you sketch with your fingers, and also we gave you the notebooks, I want you guys to sketch a lot of your own pictures too, because the more kinesthetic, the more we can use our fingers, the better we could actually develop our visual sense too. And then what you got actually do afterwards is push a layers tab, background color, you can make this black. And then you could just, under layers, you could hide the layer here. And then you could just kind of see the abstract shapes and forms. And it's a really good way for you to develop your eye as a visual artist. And once again, the secret tip is don't let yourself be limited only by photography. Allow yourself to look at anything and everything. So even like one thing I've been, I'm a, raise your hand if you're Elon Musk fanboy. Okay, so I'm crazy. He's a little lately. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Elon, I'm Elon for life. I was amazed, um, he's like, when I started SpaceX, he's like, how do you learn how to do rocket science? Like, oh, I just got textbooks and I just taught myself rocket science. I'm like, you could do that? So I Googled rocket science PDF textbook and I found one. And I looked at that, I'm like, that looks awesome. I don't know why. And I sketched it. And I was like, oh, wait a second. In terms of the shape and the form, this actually looks really elegant. This is actually like a really nice graphical shape. So this is one concept, you can write this down, it's called cross-pollination. So you know, imagine that with a little bumblebee. Get like some pollen over here. Get some pollen over here. And then I squirt out my honey. Ah. <laughs> that, that'll cost you extra. Um, and I make my own little unique honey. But because you've taken pollen from all these different sources, uh, the artistic thing you create is going to end up being super unique, right? So, uh, anyways, I got this right distracted. Let's move on. All right, uh, you back there. So let me go get some practical tips too. Is that if you're ever going to share a photo or upload or do an exhibition, the simplest way is add the city name and the date. Um, so like San Francisco, comma 2018, or um, Brooklyn, comma 2017. The reason I like this is that it allows it to tug at the viewer's ear a little, a little more because it keeps it more ambiguous so everyone can come up with their own interpretation. The reason why I really like Jackson Pollock and a lot of abstract, everyone will look at it and see something different. And therefore it actually ends up being a mirror of yourself rather than what it actually is. And so I think that's also what's good in photographs too is that there are certain pictures when you see of your own pictures that the way you interpreted a few years ago and today, it could actually be a different interpretation. What are some of you guys' favorite movies or books or novels? My Dinner with Andre. My Dinner with Andre. My Dinner with Andre. So how many times have you? Six. So when you first read it, and the last time you read it, how did your experience change? It's, it's a new lot, uh, every time. 
Um, and you guys watch the Stanley Kubrick films? So that one's based on the senior. So I think a truly great piece of art is several things. One, how many times are you willing to reread or reconsume or re-experience it? And two, every single new time you re-experience it, do you see something new or experience something new? So like, even seeing Vincent Van Gogh like potato eaters, every time I see it, you see something that's different, that you didn't notice it before. And so when you're studying other photographers, ask yourself, why do I like this photographer? Because every time I look at their pictures, I see or rediscover something new. Or even for your own pictures, that don't choose your photos that are too easy, obvious, that they're only one way to interpret it. So uh, let me give you an example. Elliot Irwin, I really love his pictures. But Elliot Irwin, he took photos of dogs jumping up and down and stuff. The only problem with his pictures, there's only one way to interpret it. There's always some sort of joke. They call it one-liner joke. But once you hear the joke, or see the joke, there's no reason for you to look at it a second time. I think really great photos uh, gives you a reason to look at it one than once. So, tugging your back ear that's a good idea. Huh? Alright, next. Or matte, or luster. So, I would actually recommend you guys to print out more your photos. And it's actually super cheap to print your photos. And even a simple photo project you guys could do, instead of printing out your photo books on blurb.com, just go to Daiso or, or Ross, pick up a cheap photo album, print out a small, bunch of small 4x6s, and just make a little photo album on your favorite pictures. Because even the process of holding these things and rearranging it, you feel more connected with your Nice. This is also another reason. I have to study a lot of the philosophy of aesthetics. Of course there is more than one interpretation, this is just my interpretation. It looks like most philosophers' aesthetics is a binary solution. Is the, is the photograph or the art piece beautiful or is it ugly? Now, this is tricky because you can photograph what some people might think is an ugly person, but you find beauty in it. So, let's say you photograph a nine-year-old woman with lots of wrinkles in her face. Aesthetically, you could think that's really beautiful, but the woman feels like she's ugly because she's older. Or you could photograph, you know, you go to photograph a Playboy model with like fake boobs like this. To me, I actually find that aesthetically ugly or repulsive, even though maybe society might find that to be beautiful. So realize that whether you find aesthetics beautiful or ugly, it's up to your own personal taste. So going back to the ice cream. What's your guys' favorite ice cream flavors? Pokey pokey. Pokey pokey. Matcha. Matcha. Vanilla. That's New Zealand. Coffee. Honey lavender. Honey lavender. What's your most hated flavor of ice cream? No. Bubble gum. Bubble gum. Yeah. Melted. Yeah. Melted. Yeah. Melted. Yeah. Melted. Yeah. Meat. 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 Raise your hand if you like mint ice cream. All right, wait, wait. Hold, hold your hands up. Bobby, are these guys all idiots for liking mint ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> so that's 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 the that's the funny thing too is that like um, with aesthetics in terms of what's beautiful for so ugly, other people have different tastes, but that's okay. It doesn't mean that they're an idiot, right? Because like for example, Cindy hates mint ice cream too, but I love mint ice cream, and then she's like, "How dare you like mint ice cream? It's disgusting." I'm like. I like it, and Cindy's like, you're stupid for like your mid <laughs> I'm just making this up. But this is what a lot of art critics will do too, is that like, an art critic might like color pictures, and you shoot black and white, and you show them black and white pictures, and they're like, your photos are horrible. It's just because you don't like vanilla ice cream, and I like chocolate, and we could all be friends, okay? All right, next. Hi, I'm Patrick. Um, I encourage you guys to, to make a website. Um, So, this, this is the reason, is um, several things. Um, ultimately, it comes down to control. And also, it's the easiest way to share your images, because... And also, uh, many things. One, um, it's the best way to consume pictures on the internet. Two, if you ever want to do an exhibition or a book or something, it's the most legitimate way for you to, to share your work that people take your work seriously. And I think three, it's just, it's just kind of fun to have actually, because like, you could change it, you could modify it, 
you can make a mobile optimized optimized for computer. So yeah, I would actually recommend you guys to make a website if possible. Um, practical tips is uh, the host I recommend is Bluehost.com is the, the hosting provider I recommend. Bluehost, like color blue, host.com. And just register your website domain, like your first name, last name, .com. it could just be like martdinkins.com or martdinkinsphoto.com, whatever. And then I would actually recommend you guys to build it on wordpress.org. It'll just allow you more open source flexibility for long-term stability. Okay, that's Hi, my name is Jim. For all of you guys, or photography is a genre, and Contribute knowledge, tools, technology, concepts, ideas, philosophies to empower other photographers. Because, like, honestly, for me personally, I don't really care if I'm remembered for my photography or not. For me, what's more meaningful and impactful is sharing information and ideas and creating things which empowers other photographers. Because, like, I feel like that's a better way for me to leverage my, my skills to help you all. Because, like, it could be a domino effect, right? Like, you know, I could help you guys become better photographers, and then maybe one day you're in Vietnam, you teach a kid how to do photography. Or that's so. That's that's actually my ultimate hope is everything you guys learn in this workshop, pay it forward, share it with your friends, families, and whatever. Because for me, like, I don't really care for my own pictures that much at the end of the day. But it's more like, how can I help society? And I think for me, the camera is just a tool of empowerment. So like, I'm the same way too, like, if I'm on white, you know, I got my Bose headphones on, I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody, it's like, in my own world, but like, photography kind of gives me a chance to actually connect with other humans, and actually on the way, um, me and Cindy and Anna drove over from San Jose today, I'm like, man, I'm just so excited to see all the students and catch up and hang out with you guys and share ideas, because this is the most real thing and the best experience we could ever get in photography meet other passionate photographers in real life. Because so much of our photographic lives are mediated through Facebook, Instagram, and social media. I think what we all ultimately want is a real life in-person experience. Otherwise, we'd all just be jacked into the matrix and not having real experiences, right? So I really encourage all of us in this workshop is for us to share our own personal experiences and our own personal visions with others. Because Ultimately, I'm going to learn from you guys as much as you guys learn from me, but also all of us were like nodes in a network. How all of us share random ideas and experiences is going to help benefit all of us too. So even things I'd recommend like um, in our email thread, whenever you want to spam the group with anything interesting you find or your picture, just click reply all and send stuff to each other because there might be things that we didn't even know we were interested in. So then let's say I see a new machine learning algorithm trying to find the images. I might just send it to you guys. And you guys could ignore the email, but who knows? You guys might be interested in it. Or like you could send a UI, UX design concept or something from computer science. I think it could be really cool. All right? So everyone, fist bump your partner. Yeah. There's five parts of photography. I've kind of discovered this, okay? Five parts of photography. The first part of photography is identifying scenes that you think might be interesting to photograph. So the first one is identification. The second one is working the scene is once you've discovered something you actually want to photograph, how do you compose the scenes and how do you actually shoot it? How many times do you shoot? Okay. That's step two. Step three is once you get home, it's image selection. How do you choose your best pictures? Like, which ones are your best? Which ones should you keep? Which ones should you ditch? Etc. Step four is the post processing. Once you've discovered the pictures you like, how are we going to process the pictures? Black and white, color, contrast, etc. And step five is the publishing side of things. Is that like if I'm working on a project? Um, how do I edit it down to my best pictures? What order do I put it in? Do I print it as a photo book, as a zine on the internet, blah, 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 etc. Okay? So these are the five steps. So this is re what's really difficult is that when you want to improve in your photography, you got to think to yourself, which of these elements
do you actually really want to work on? Because there's some of us that, for example, I don't really like to post process, so I just shoot JPEG. But some of us really like to post process. And discovering your own style of photography is really figuring out all five of these elements and aspects. Because your own personal style is, um, I did some study in Latin. So do you know where the word style comes from? <laughs> yeah, stylus. Right? Let me see that Apple pencil. Right? So the word style comes from stylus, right? So the way I interpret style is when Virgil wrote the Aeneid, to be able to see his style means to see, imagine him with his pencil or his pen to actually write the story. So anything that you as a viewer allows you to see the soul of the photographer or the artist is your style. So your style could be very simple, like, do you shoot black and white or color? Or your style could be, how do you photograph people? What do you photograph? How many photos do you shoot at the scene? What is your composition and so forth, right? So when you're, when you're discovering your own style, honestly, a lot of it too is the editing thing, is how do you decide to present your work? So for example, let's say I want to go out and shoot flowers, sunsets, food, and street photography. The biggest mistake I think many of us photographers make is in the editing and the image selection. You're only as good as your weakest picture that you share. And honestly, in today's world, our problem is we have too many good pictures to share. And we want to share all of our pictures. The biggest mistake a lot of photographers do is they share too much photos. Honestly, if you die and you have about 10 good pictures, you've kind of done your job as a photographer. So tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about more like editing down your, your, your project. Now what I actually want to do is I want to give you guys some practical composition concept ideas. I think ultimately um, a lot of your style in photography is the aesthetic component. So aesthetics in terms of the composition of your pictures. And the purpose of this workshop, one thing We'll focus on today is I'll give you guys different compositional tools and try out these different compositional tools and see how you could incorporate it into your photography. Okay? So the first concept I want to share with you is the arabesque. Okay? Arabesque. arabesque. So who knows this word? So what is what is the arabesque? Well it's in, in ballet it's actually a particular move, but yep. an arabesque is like a curvilinear Figure. So the word is this. Our, uh, How do you spell it? Oops. <clears throat> Arabesque. So easy way to remember it. The word arabesque between a curve and an arabesque is that it's kind of like um, <laughs> Cindy says the easiest. Imagine squiggly line. <laughs> so you can either call it an arabesque or call it a squiggly line. So for example, look at me. Straight line. Slight curve. Arabesque. Have you guys ever seen statues at the museum? Are they just like this? So, some of them, right? But generally they're like this. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're always like, like rustling and dragging or something. Right? <laughs> this is actually a good pro tip, practical tip. If you want to make more engaging portraits of people, have them stand backwards and turn around and look at you. The more you can engage people's body to move, the better. So I'll, I'll show you guys some examples. Alright, 
Alright, so everyone just pick up your finger, look at this image, and draw a squiggly line. Where do you see it? Anything that allows you to do more squiggly, the better. So you can even see, right? Faces. Do you notice that these hands also go in opposing directions? Or you could even create a circle here. There's so many different ways you can analyze it, right? But, because her, this is the thing too, is that whenever people's hands are pointing a certain way, essentially imagine the finger as a pointing device. So imagine a little red arrow that points this way, that points this way, and creates a kind of a curve. So our best is like a curve on steroids. Imagine you take two curves, and you connect them to make a more elegant composition. And I said this uh, last week, but I think what makes a really good composition is simple and elegant. Simple and elegant. Simple is that you don't want it to be too complicated, but elegant as in like having curves and dynamism and things, okay? So the first assignment I'll give you guys in terms of composition is RFS. So we'll practice this um, with each other first because we'll shoot some portraits of each other where we can actually do the movement. But practical ways you could apply an arabesque in street photography is this. If you're shooting a street portrait, so if you guys want to practice doing street portraits, you just have somebody not just looking you straight up, have people, ask people to do hand gestures and to curve their arms. So for example, and you know this guy? <laughs> that looks like a homeless dude in the mission. <laughs> right? Use your finger again. Where do you see the curves for the arabesque? Right? Kind of like, you know, you can see all this different motion district. You got you got the Illuminati triangle there. <laughs> um, but you can see, right? The more you could create curves or arabesques or movement in your subjects, the better. So even things you could do is that like um, you could ask your subject to jump up and down a little bit to loosen up. Say, oh can you can you face this wall but just turn around and look back at the camera? The more you can engage people's movements. Or you could just say, oh just do fun hand gestures. Even if people do something like this, do you see the arabesque or the curve in me? Like, that's why girls always love to do this in Vegas photos, because it actually <laughs> does add a nice arabesque. And the thing is, a lot of us, we're already probably doing the arabesque composition, but we just don't know yet. So, the first thing you guys could focus on is to the, ooh, that's a good one. That was the, this, this, uh, do you guys know this very handsome, sexy man? I think he goes by the name of Eric Kim. Okay? So that's the first compositional tool you guys can focus on, is working on the arabesque, or curve, or squiggly line. Also, practical tips, too, is when you're shooting street photography, if you have multiple subjects in the scene, you can also create an arabesque. So you can pick up your finger here, Draw a squiggly line between all the peoples. So you can see, right? There's kind of like the squiggly line which connects all of them. So even if you're shooting street photography, if you have many different subjects, while you're shooting in your mind, try to think about how all these people connect, or you know, oftentimes you'll discover the arabesque or the squiggly line after you shoot street photography. So. <coughs> And often what I like to do is look at the different directions and try to visualize in three dimensions how all the movement is working on the movement, okay? So the first one is our best, okay? The second thing I want you guys to do is try to do triangle composition. Okay? So, I'm going to pick up the finger, draw the triangle you see here. So where's the triangle? Any faces. Okay. Okay. So you can see, right? There's this triangle here that connects all of them. But there's also, this is why these guys are so good, there's also an arabesque because 
You see this curve here that's pointing like this way, but you also have all the eye directions going this way. So this is a combination of a triangle plus an arabesque. So obviously, these are painters, they can sit down and do this for a long time. In street photography, you're not so fortunate. But the, sec uh, the second simple assignment I'll give you is, when you're shooting street photography, include three faces or three people in the photo. Okay? So you can also see here, this is a combination of the RBS, just the, the movements, okay? And um, the last thing I want you guys to do is, I think one of the best ways to capture emotion is actually through hand gestures. Hand gestures, very simple. Everyone take their hands. What does our buddy mimic the hand gesture of our buddy Jesus? <laughs> what do you think he's doing? Counting? Flipping off? Okay. This guy here? <laughs> do this on the table. Do that hand gesture. What does this mean? Waves are good. <laughs> Party at three. So, one of the best ways to, once again, right, hands. <laughs> I can't tell you that. <laughs> I like the yeah. too. And then, now, now I want everyone to do, try to imitate his face too. Shai <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> is so good. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, she's an actress. Yeah, I remember that last Oh, I love that. Okay. So, whenever you're looking at photographs or art, always kind of think and ask yourself. What are people doing with their hands? Because hand is often what has the hand has the emotion. So if you want to make a more emotional impact on your viewers, try to get the hands. Okay. So once again, pretend like you're holding an imaginary baby Jesus. How is Mary holding it? What is baby Jesus doing? That was this dude. But that's not my son. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the third one. So the first one is arabesque. The second one is triangle. The third is... Uh, yeah, okay. So let's all go, um, go to the patio outside and I'll give you guys a real life demonstration. Okay. So this is, this is all correct. Um, but in modern society, when people say, oh, quit being so pretentious, or you're so pretentious, yeah. what do people actually really mean to say? Or what do they think they're saying? Don't be a big shot. Yeah, a big shot. Um, what else? Douchebag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Show like, off. Judgmental. Yeah. Judgmental. Essentially, what they're trying to say, I, uh, the way I understand it is when you're saying pretentious, say, oh, quit being so pretentious. They're not actually saying quit, being, uh, quit pretending. I think what they actually mean to say is don't be a douchebag. Don't be yeah. an asshole. Don't be a don't be a don't be a a not nice person. Yeah. Don't be a bad person, right? But is it more like stop making me feel bad? It's actually more about the person complaining. Yeah. And there's some the element person. of like you're being condescending to them yeah. as if there's some hierarchy that you, they have to come to you. Yeah, like someone who probably has a better camera or someone who's who's not ex as experienced and has more as experience and, and, and feeling down about yourself and then being derogatory towards them and saying that, you know, maybe my work is better because I can't seem to do better than you. Yeah. yeah. No, you guys you guys are totally right. You guys touch upon a really good point. So uh, to what what uh, what Rand and Cindy mentioned. Hey, 
We're talking about being a pretentious artist. <laughs> Eric, Eric Kipps, yeah. 10 unforgettable tips to become a pretentious artist. Brandon and Cindy bring up a really good point is, I think this is the problem with art and just life in general, is that people treat life like a zero-sum game. So do you know the concept of a zero-sum game? That's okay. So what, what is the concept of a zero-sum game? At the end of it, you're no better or no worse off. The true. Oh, yeah, so that like if you gain something, then that necessarily detracts from something else. Yeah. So it's a fixed sum of total available whatever. Exactly. Greatness. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use an analogy. Y'all like do you guys like my analogies? Uh oh. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I do. Oh, so it, it, raise it, it, your hand if you have ever once played Pokemon. <laughs> Pokemon. Uh, red. Any of them. Go. Raise your hand if you've ever played um, Diablo. Or any any uh, raise your hand if you've ever played any RPG role playing game where you have certain levels for your characters. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna use a Pokemon analogy. Okay, so imagine that you're a level 50 Charizard. You guys know Charizard? The big. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll use my example. Pikachu. Everyone knows Pikachu. Right? Yeah. You all know Pikachu? The yellow one. The yellow, the yellow. Huh? Electric rodent. The yellow electric rodent. If we're being PC in the mission, okay? And is um, Pikachu is genderless, by the way. It's not a guy or a girl. Anyways, so you're level fifty Pikachu, right? And then you meet all these other Pokemon friends, right? And you're like, I'm a level fifty Pikachu. And people are like, that's pretentious, because <laughs> you're making me feel bad because I'm only a level ten Squirtle. Squirtle's the little um, blue turtle, really cute too. So imagine you're in a little village. Everyone's at Squirtle, like these little cute blue turtles. But everyone's only level 10, okay? And you're level 50, you're level 50 Pikachu. And say, hey, you know, I'm a level 50 Pikachu. Um, you know, I got Quick Attack, I got Thunderbolt, and I could also look really cute, right? But the, all these little Squirtle friends be like, how dare you be so pretentious and talk down on us? Do you think you're better than us, Pikachu? Just because you're yellow and we're... So, so to use this analogy in real life, people assume that by you just talking about your own artistic accomplishments and your own goals, they think that you're actually looking down on them and actually making people feel worse than they are actually. But the thing is, in real life, it's not a zero-sum game, meaning we could all win in life. So just because I'm level 50 doesn't mean you could, you, you also cannot be level 50. If anything, I think we should all be working to turn all of us level 99, which is the maximum level of Pokemon. We could all become level 99. So I think what it means to achieve your personal maximum in photography and life is for all of us to help uplift one another to become level 99, right? But the problem is, once again, when you're honest about your accomplishments, most other people are gonna think you're talking down on you, and then you're gonna think that you're better than them because of people's own insecurity. So essentially what I mean to say is this, as you guys advance in your photographic journey and become better visual artists, there's gonna be a lot of people who criticize you or critique you or say bad things about you. And it's not necessarily because you're a bad person, but it's just people are insecure about themselves and they're projecting their own insecurity on you. And I know I can speak from personal experience because um, apparently Eric Kim is one of the most hated photographers on the internet and on YouTube. So if you guys ever read my YouTube comments, you guys can know that uh, Eric Kim could eat a big old banana peel. Um, so a lot of people on the internet don't like me and it's very unfortunate because I like almost everybody. <laughs> and I can openly say I love humanity, I love, I love people and I, I love all you guys and I want to see you guys all become level 99. But once you guys all reach level 99, I want you guys to find the missing no hack and become level 255. You guys know missing no? Nope. So there's um, there's a hack within the game. So generally in the game, you can only become level 99. There's actually an Easter egg hack in the game where you could break the system and actually level up to level 255. So I think this is like, this is like your matrix moment in real life is that like, you think you're bounded by reality, and then you have the Neo mode in it, and then you see that everything just green kanji code, and then you could essentially mold reality to your own vision. So I'm getting a little bit off topic, but essentially what I mean to say is, when you promote yourself as an artist, 
there's nothing bad about self-promotion. Because when people say, oh, he's such a self-promoter, what do they really mean to say? I'm intimidated by you. I can never do that. I can never do it. What else? I wish I were doing that. I wish I were doing that. Because what's easier? Is it easier to be a gladiator fighting somebody to do that? Or to be a commentator in the, in the stands saying, Hey, quit being such a, a wimp. <laughs> it's true, right? That's what people on the YouTubes and internet and Instagram are. And even worse, people are anonymous. So can you even imagine you're a gladiator actually fighting like, oh, and getting like this <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> and then you have all these people in the, the crowd with masks on making fun of you. That's essentially what the internet is like. So in some ways, the internet culture is quite toxic. That's why I think having real life interactions like this is better. So I really encourage all you guys, when in doubt, be more self-promotional than you think you should. When in doubt, be more pushy than you think you should. Also, when in doubt, focus, focus on yourself and also <coughs> promote yourself or think of yourself 25% more than you think you are because the reason is this, I think most of us actually underestimate ourselves. And so when in doubt, think of yourself 25% higher than you think you should. Um, practical things like even in business and marketing, when, when people message you say, oh, you know, you want to do a photo shoot for me? Oh, I've never done this before. How much should I charge, right? This is like a common question. Or I'm having an exhibition for a gallery show. How much should I sell my prints or my, my photographs for? So let's say in your mind, you're like, okay, you know, my gut says maybe I should sell, I should do this photo shoot for like 300 bucks, right? Try to charge 25% more than you think you should and you can just round up. So you can say, oh, 400 bucks. And you, you're, you'd be amazed, like I even had this one ad agency contact me like maybe two years ago for a pretty big gig. And they're like, oh, it's gonna involve these big car brands and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, how much would this cost you? And I'm like, I'm just gonna be ridiculous and troll and see how far I can push it. Well, I'm totally gonna play the part. So I was just like, oh, you know, that sounds good. Da, 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 da. But you know, the least I can do is for 30,000. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I've never, I've never asked for more than $10,000. So from $10,000 to $30,000, I just like put it out there. I'm like, let's just throw it out to the wind and see what happens. And I'm just like, feeling a little bit nervous, self-conscious. I'm all, oh, don't hear a response for a few days. I'm all, oh, am I kind of like, was that was it kind of the dick move to do? Like kind of the pretentious whatever thing to do? And then email back, he's like, yeah, we talked to our client. Yeah, totally doable. Um, can you tell us also like, um, you know, what hotel you want to stay at and your flight? I'm like, whoa, like, this is crazy, right? Ultimately, to so sort of I didn't get it because I don't know why. But essentially, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you should say twenty five percent less. Yeah. <laughs> so, but once again, I think in life, life is too short to be boring. Why not just try to push the limit and see what you're capable of? Um, so yeah, let's use this opportunity for all of us to not downplay ourselves as artists or visual artists or photographers, or even if you don't want to label yourself at all. There's no rules in photography. There's only tips and suggestions. And so let's go in a circle. And this is gonna be our little Socratic seminar opportunity for us to create an opportunity to put yourself in your life, okay? Cool. Through my imagery and invite us all to the table. Whoa, that was really good! Yay. I like the idea of inviting you to the table because often in artist statements to use um, concrete analogy because we all like to sit at a table together and share a meal together. Even do you know the word companion? Do you know what the word companion means? With bread? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Sorry? Yeah. With hey, bread. Plus. So if you go to Italian deli, what's that thing you eat? Breadsticks. Breadsticks. Breadstick or uh, nanini? Nanini. <laughs> yeah. Pan means bread. What? Companion with com means with pan means bread with bread. So literally, a companion means somebody you eat bread with. Hmm. So my Berkeley low carb gluten friends would not be your companions. <laughs> but I, I I really like your analogy of bringing it to the table. That's that's man. That was man. That was good. Okay, stand up. One, two, three. Hi, Elsa. Uh, I prefer anonymized figures as well as abstracted form and color interactions. 
I frequently express the meditative pleasure I find in the idiosyncratic textures characteristic of physical phenomena, drips, splatters, droplets, peelings, and cracks. While my subject matter is typically inanimate and often banal, I hope to emphasize that the responsibility for the perception of beauty lies with the observer. Whoa! Whoa. What I really like about Elsa's talk is um, that she used very active visual imagery. So mm -hmm. what's the ones you guys remember the... Drips, splatters. <laughs> so like, you could actually see it, right? So this is actually why next time you're with your friends, and say, oh, you know, I went to this party and I did this. Rather than sharing them the picture, actually try to use your words to describe the visual image, and it actually engages your viewer more. So that's that's actually really good. Uh, and actually, what I liked about what Elsa did too, um, there's always the debate whether you should write first person or third person. Honestly, just follow your own gut. So you can say, I seek to do da da da. That's okay. Or Eric Kim seeks to do, blah blah blah. So either way works. Okay. Alex. Wait, first of all, let everyone look at that wow. sweater. Wow! <laughs> so this sweater was acquired one year ago today, um, near Harajuku, during an Eric Kim workshop. Yeah! <laughs> so we all, we all we walked to the back alley, took an LSD pill, and decided to go shopping. So the author, Tom Wolfe, uh, wrote that contemporary art has basically devolved into literature. Uh, so taking a very pretentious <laughs> model, uh, Alex Morgan is an artist who works in a range of still visual media across the full spectrum of colors, visible and invisible. He seeks to capture the ambiguous moments between moments. A special focus is on organic forms and interactions with the built environment with attention to the biological and psychological systems underlying human vision and perception. Oh, good. Well, what I actually really like about that too is that like, um, when you mentioned the biological but also the man-made structure, because in my mind, I thought of like flora and molecules and shit. Then I thought of like industrial wasteland. So once again, having that visual imagery or that contrast between those both elements was really, really good. Very good. And you're going to have to give me one. We're going to go back to Japan and give me one of those. My only regret from Japan is not buying that with you. <laughs> only regret. Only regret. Okay? Right? Stand up. Wow. What's your name? Fuck. I'm Fabio. One, two, three. Hi, Hi Fabio. Fabio. So, I don't know if I get it or not. You have to tell me. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, go for it. So, in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Let's end the world. Mm -hmm. So it seems that in the it seems that in the end he was right. Streets are full of contradiction where we are all different but equal, for necessity or dreams. For necessity or dream, I'm sorry for it. No, 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 keep going. It's okay. Yeah. So, are you as an artist to make them famous in a shot or mm. for a few minutes? Or are they looking for you to become famous as most want to be photographed by us? So, uh, in his own way, each of us wants attention and not not to be abandoned. 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 To me, it seems like they want to be into white and not into black. Mm. This is the reason that pushes me into street photography and try to, cap to capture or be captured by them. Oh, oh really good. Yeah. Cool. Wait, so this is where, this yeah. is where you're very poetic. Is choose the analogy of black Thank or white. You. I don't think I've ever heard an artist statement where they actually mentioned the artist statement to make white or black. And actually that's like such powerful visual imagery. And also, um, and I actually really like how you started off with uh, the Andy Warhol quote yeah. too, because, uh, do you guys know that quote? 15 minutes. So, um, I think, It's, it's also interesting too because you talk about relationship between the photographer and the person being photographed. Is that like, both people kind of want to be famous now, right? Is that the person in the picture wants to be famous, but also you as a photographer want to be famous. So it's kind of this interesting dance between both parties. So I really like that you're kind of setting the stage. It's kind of like, um, you're telling people what the, the situation of modern life is. Because who knows, maybe 
hundred years in the future, someone might read your artist statement. They'll, oh, everyone wanted to be famous in the past. Now we just have like crowds of AI robots just clapping at us <laughs> while we give our speeches, right? So, I mean, oh, so as a crazy thought experiment. So raise your hand if, if you have Instagram. Okay. Totally. What if, what if, what if, what if tomorrow you woke up and you looked at your Instagram and you actually discovered, and let's say this is the truth, that 99% of your followers were actually bots and all the people leaving you comments were actually bots just leaving comments? Would that change your, your opinion of your own photos or your self-esteem? Probably, right? I don't know. It doesn't bother me. Like, I'm in, because I, I, I had a lot of people that, like, hashtag me, and I got, like, bots following me. Oh, okay. So most of, like, a quarter percentage of it is fake, and then the rest is real, real honest people. Yeah. So, and, and it, it doesn't bother me, though. What I post doesn't bother me. My image and my own story is reflected on myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, I, I totally agree. But yeah. I, what I mean to say is this, like, so let's say I had, let's say I had 100,000 followers, and then tomorrow morning I woke up, and I actually discovered in reality... <laughs> Without without my knowledge, nine hundred nine ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine of my followers were actually bots. It's not a measure of quality. It's a measure of quantity. Yeah, and also like I would feel shocked because, you know, then it um, yeah like if that happened to me I'd be I'd be totally shocked and it's actually already happening right now like uh, Xiao you're even mentioning in uh, China how much does it cost to buy followers now? Oh, like ten bucks you get two thousand followers. Twitter. Yeah. So they already have this on Instagram. I'm not actually sure what the numbers are right now, but let's say you can get a lot for very little. So once again, this is why I think you're, um, you're setting the stage is very important because I think in 2018, we're actually experiencing AMB Warhol's prophetic future on an even more exaggerated level. So I think that was, that was very good. Thank you. Italian Stallion, man. <laughs> Virgil, man. Hashtag Virgil. You should read it in Italian. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm telling you, man. Fabio, dude. All right. Oh, stand up. Okay. Sure that I can. Oh, here come. I'll stand here. It's the podium. Oh. Yeah. It's like the Agora in ancient Greece. Okay. Um, I shoot street photography to capture the most fleeting moments, the way that they appear in my memory. The use of motion is very important to me to convey the elusiveness of the small moments that make up the bulk of everyday life. I find beauty in the dichotomy of a still frame that holds motion and also distorts or may distort faces and expressions. It reminds me that we are all the same animal despite our more obvious differences. Wow. What do you guys think about the last sentence? It's true. Yeah. That, that so no matter how many photographers are out in this world, we're all making an impact. That's what I thought. Oh, that's good. What do, what do you think of that? Um, well, I think a lot of times uh, humans get too maybe pretentious that like, oh, we're, we're human beings, we're above everything, and like we're on a completely different level. But for me, essentially, we're all animals that like we created this like different society, and it's important to remember our roots too, and to not just almost think we're above it too. So I did really like that line. Was that your intention? Um, no, not exactly. I probably should have spent more time on it. Um, what I meant that, like, I, I like to shoot things that are not conventionally necessarily beautiful or people that are not conventionally beautiful or attractive. And yet when my goal when you look at an image that, you know, that I took when you see something like that is um, that you see their beauty despite their conventional flaws mm. or, or the lines on their face or that you, you see, you feel your humanity, you feel uh, uh, something for, for the person. Um, and that's what I meant by uh, that we're all the same. We're, we're, we're all the same, no matter, you know, no matter what the, the outside looks like. I, I think it's really easy, and this isn't taking away from fashion photography at all, but <laughs> if you take a picture of a beautiful person, stereotypically beautiful, stereotypically conventionally beautiful person, 
Eric Kim. Like Eric. <laughs> you know, you're going to get their beauty, right? But if you take a picture of a conventionally less beautiful person, then you, you're going to have to do something to show their f fragile humanity beauty. So you're going to have to find something to connect that to. And to me, that's the challenge that I really enjoy. Yeah. No, you're, you're totally right. Is um, So it's more difficult to photograph an interesting photo of a boring person or a boring thing than to make a boring picture of an interesting thing. So um, you guys have your notebooks. You guys can write down some, some of these notes. Um, so, oh, and also, um, who was the partner for the... Oh, yes, this is... Oh, yeah. Wait, who's, um, who's partners with, uh, um, with Patrick? Oh, Patrick, me, and me. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So, um, all right. So this is uh, 120 years of photography wisdom distilled for you guys. Mm -hmm. So, four years ago, I did a I did a workshop with Magnum photographer Konstantin Manos. He was recruited into Magnum, which is essentially the NBA of photography, by Henri Cartier-Bresson himself, who is Michael Jordan of the photographic world. And he uh, he was my teacher. He taught me uh, one one lesson that stuck with me for a long time is. Don't get suckered by the exotic. Don't get suckered by the exotic. So this is the reason why it's very difficult to make good pictures in India. Because like everything's exotic and interesting and sexy. But most honestly, most of the pictures we shoot in India are kind of not that interesting. Same thing like when I went to Vietnam. My only mission in Vietnam was do not take cliche pictures of people in rice paddy hats. So what I did instead was I went opposite is I only photographed rich people at the mall. Now, I'd photograph Vietnamese people driving around their gold Rolls Royces and shit like that. So, I think that's really um, very honorable what you're doing, is trying to show beauty through unconventional ways of seeing beauty. Because it is, I think, very important to, to challenge, challenge convention. So maybe what you are as a photographer is you're a, a convention challenger. I like that. All my life. Even your hair is not conventional. <laughs> All non -conventional, my life. Non conventional, non conventional <laughs> hair, you know? Breaking borders, okay? So, Annette, you could you go too. Oh, no. Okay, we'll go to Cindy. <laughs> I'm okay. not prepared. So, oh, yeah, we didn't, oh, I apologize. Cindy didn't have a chance to introduce herself, so stand up. Okay. One, two, three. Hi. Hi, Hi Cindy. Cindy. <laughs> All right, give us your artist statement or, or mission statement. Uh, Off the fly. Off the fly. Okay. Um. Okay, um, so Cindy Wynn, <laughs> um, dreams and hopes to continue to help others dream through um, producing um, or creating stories, uh, stories from visual imagery, poetry, writing, um, even in the moment like this, that helps to bring people to think of a dream that they once had when they were young, or a certain fleeting moment that they might have forgotten. Um, through um, you know, transgressing all these different forms of visual as well as literary media, Cindy hopes to uh, continue to inspire people to, to dream, to create, uh, to continually imagine and remember their inner child. Yay! <laughs> So, if you guys are curious, Cindy is my ultimate hype man. You ever watch rap music videos and those random guys in the back with <laughs> flamethrowers? <laughs> <laughs> Cindy is the person with the flamethrower behind me. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. Okay. Stand up. And what's your name? Hi, my name is Andrew. One, two, three. Hi, Hi Andrew. Andrew. Uh, so, Andrew Lai is an explorer in the philosophy of, of, of abstraction. He dances between abstruse complexity and lucid metaphors. He aspires to create abstractions that allow all humans to see further and understand more deeply. Oh! oh! How did you get the concept of the word lucid? That's actually a very good word. 
I was searching in Christian dictionary. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was extremely poetic. Um, very very beautiful. I, I really like that one. You should. Thank you. You should you should write more actually. You know, this is actually the funny thing too. Okay, you know a lot of um, English as second language learner say, "Oh, I'm sorry, my English sucks." Right? No, no, no. Actually, the truth is, people who do not have English as first language often are more poetic than when they're talking. They actually speak more poetically, more interesting. Because, for example, when you're writing in English, you might be thinking Italian, or you might be thinking Chinese, or whatever. And there are certain words which are actually more specific and less commonly used, which are actually far more interesting. So I would actually say, even for me, uh, learning Vietnamese has helped me become more precise in my thinking too. So even um, in Vietnamese, to work, do you know what to work in Vietnamese means? It means, the word is lam an, which means work eat, labor eat. So in Vietnamese, to work just means to labor in order to provide food. So then I started to realize, wow, like, uh, if you're working in your life and you have enough food to feed yourself, why do you still want to keep working? So anyways, what I, what I mean to say is that even though, once again, you might feel like English is not so strong, you kind of own it. Don't apologize. Just speak as you are. And also, like, realize that my Italian will never be as good as yours. Nor will my Chinese be ever as good as yours either. So kind of like, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine, right? Okay. Very, very good. Okay, All right. I am Xiaoyu. One, two, three. Hi, Xiaoyu. Xiaoyu uh, evokes a spirit of curiosity in her audience by simply showing her soul. Her photos embrace humor and a splash of color. They enable people to see seemingly familiar things in a completely new way. Yeah! I like the splash of color. I like your jacket? Oh, yeah. Yeah! Shall you adding a splash of color to everyone's life. I like that. You should tell that to all the, the gothic people in uh, New York City. Nice. Alright? Moving to um, me. To the, to the genius back there. So I was, I'm still on East Coast time. I processed all my photos, and then it's like, oh shit. I, it's okay. Stand up, stand up. Give it no, no, no. I, so I, what I did? Yep. Oh, okay. yep. I don't want to stand up. Okay. So what I did <laughs> is I actually went back and uh, dug out an artist statement from like five years ago oh, that cool. I wrote, and I was thought I'd have to edit it, but I decided it was still all true. So it makes me wonder why the hell I'm taking all these workshops. <laughs> um, for me, photography is a tool to change the way I see the world. The goal is not so much producing a photo as the process of taking it. Focusing a camera causes me to focus on things that I might normally miss. The camera helps me see details of the world that might otherwise blend into the background. Looking for an image to capture directs me to the subtleties of both the natural and human world. Oh, so beautiful! What are, what are, what are... Uh, could you guys relate to his artist statement? Which parts? The cussing Eric for making us write one of these things. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of the process making you appreciate. I, I don't know. I'm not going to interpret it my way, but into my frame. But the that you it forces you to appreciate the world more, so it actually enhances your experience. So it's it's sort of about your process. So yes. Like kind of like. You know, Andrew said explorer, and I really like that. Sort of like you're an intrepid adventurer. Mm. Ooh, that's a good word to intrepid. Also, what I like too is that it's so funny because in everyday talk we say, "Oh, what should you focus on today? What should you focus on today?" And it's such a good metaphor in photography because there's literally the notion of focusing your lens, which is such an elementary concept, but still super powerful because, like, that's what that's what you know. That's what photography is all about. Like you couldn't make a picture without um, the focus. Um, and yeah, it's also too. It's nice because I think the nice thing about your artist statement too, Mark, is that when you're often writing these artist statements or going back into your old artist statements, it kind of reminds you why you do something. And I would actually say that if your mission statement hasn't changed the last five years, I would actually think 
you're very enlightened because you just dis you discovered some deeper truth on why you do it and then you still do you're still driven by that same authentic pursuit of appreciating life and i think that's like super zen man yes thank you're you you're like my zen roshi dude <laughs> mark just teach me your ways can you can you decode my human genome we, we can arrange that <laughs> can, can, <laughs> and we won't know anything more than we already do <laughs> Nice, okay, June? Okay. Stand up. What's your name? Hi, my name is June. One, Hi, June. two, three. Hi, Hi June. Hi, everybody. Um, to me, photography is a medium of connection. Um, hiding behind the uh, viewfinder gives me the courage to reach out to people, make connections, and share life. Through capturing energy, stress, and anxiety, I am learning how to deal with my own. Oh, wow. so beautiful! Beautiful. What do you guys like about that? Very personal. What do you guys like about that? Very personal. Elaborate. Well, he's talking about his own anxieties, his own growth, and how this is a meeting. So we can all relate to that. Put yourself out there. I think it actually takes so much courage to show your insecurities or to put yourself in a vulnerable person. Like, there's actually some ancient philosophy I wrote is that, like, the truly, the truly powerful person is one who's not ashamed to show his scars. So I think that's actually, man, I get like, you see these goosebumps? I'm in the sun, I get goosebumps. So once again, like, um, the more courageous you can make yourself in terms of being very honest with what you do, the more you could also empower other people. And man, that's, that's so beautiful. I haven't cried since the Lion King won. I also have to cry right there. You remember when, like, Jafar? Jafar? I came up with you. She's like, claws of all. But the Mufasa's like, no! So sad. So sad. Okay. I'm gonna help you. It makes me cry. That was not that, okay? Alright, Mr. Ford. Oh. Stand up. Uh, hello, I'm Harrison. One, two, three. Hi, Hi Harrison. Harrison. Hi, everybody. Uh, I used a artistic statement generator in my email last night, and it generated a paragraph of nonsense, which I sent out. I loved it, by the way. Yeah, really, really ridiculous stuff. But I wrote a real one while I was... We oh, okay, so this is the real one. Okay, good. Uh, hopes to create open photographs where people can invent their own stories upon the like Harrison stands up, opens book, statement, sits down. Zen poem, Eric Kim. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. It actually, this, this is actually the ironic thing. Sometimes the shorter and the simpler and the more um, simple and elegant your statement is, the better. That's why, uh, any of you guys into like a uh, Zen haiku poetry thingy? Um, do you know what uh, haiku poetry is? What is, what is it? Seven five seven five five seven five. I think you're right. Cindy, what's your favorite um, poem? poem? Haiku poem. Basho. Uh, Basho. Do you remember it? Um. <laughs> Pick the music video. Yeah, I know. A monk. Oh, a monk sips morning tea. It's quiet. The sound of water. <laughs> uh, or the, the frog jumps in? Oh, I'm combining two. I don't remember it. The frog jumps in. Oh, so one of the best uh, poems by um, a Zen haiku poet, his name is Basho. It, it was, I think it goes, I'm paraphrasing, it goes, um, a frog jumps in, splash. Huh? It's a frog jumps in, the sound of um, a frog jumps in, splash the sound of water. Or a frog jumps in. I think it's uh, frog jumps in, splash the sound of water. So it's like it's just super simple, but it evokes very strong visual imagery. And I think what you did in keeping it short and sweet. Like, have you guys ever been to a wedding and then like someone goes on for like thirty minutes <laughs> about like Vegas? You're like boring, but then someone's just like, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet, and then just like. Two sentences, everyone just like applauds. <laughs> oh, you guys want to hear a random story? Do you guys like my stories? Yeah. 
Yes. Do you guys want to hear my embarrassing uh, cousin's story? Oh. Sure. Sure. If it's less than 30 yeah, cheese. It's very bad. <laughs> but it has all right, to be all right, all right, all right. So imagine that I'm a 60-year-old middle-aged Korean man, okay? And then my daughter, um, Julie, is getting married, okay? So Korean girl named Julie is getting married, right? It's like, I tell you a story about Julie. <laughs> One day, I had a dream. I go to river. I see cow. <laughs> Cow's drinking water. Cow walks away. <laughs> that cow is my daughter Julie. <laughs> 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 he drops the bike and just walks. No, no, and then all of our, all the non-Korean friends went up to the Koreans like, What does it mean? We're like, we have no fucking idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what is the cow a symbol of? We're like, we have no idea. I'm too whitewashed. Oh, okay. So, uh, continuing. <laughs> I am George. One, two, three. Hi, Hi George. George. Wait, wait, wait. Stop. George. You see how the light's going from behind his head? Yeah. That's what they call Jesus light. <laughs> right. So first, that. Yeah. Uh, I take uh, pictures to, to share. I like to talk with people and uh, try to make my skills better. Golf clap. So whenever uh, you think of an artist statement, think of Eric Kim's cow analogy. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm one, two, three. Hi, Hi Jeff. Uh, so I had a, a really good time writing this, and now that I read it to myself again, I have no idea what I was trying to say. <laughs> but anyways, let's see what happens. And I think I meant to say opposites. So that hmm. uh, the necessity for day and night to show grit and success and freedom and failure, hmm. wisdom and new ideas and beauty and old technique. That is beautiful. Wow. Wait. What does that mean? Well, there's, you know, there's, for example, when you think about how paper is made today, it's automated, there's machines that do it, but there's also guys in Japan that spend a week making one sheet, um, and it's, you know, hundreds of steps, and it's a question of why is that still a method that is, is viable today, and how are they still able to, to make that, you know, sustainable in any way, but... Um, the fact that they're still practicing that old technique and that old method, and the fact that people are still willing to pay hundreds of dollars for one sheet of paper, mm. um, I think there's there's beauty in that, in, in kind of the whole process. Um, and sometimes it's hard to explain why it's still uh, still happening, but you know at the same time it's it's I don't see it going away anytime soon. Either. Being able to kind of preserve that is. Well, it's, it's also great too. Um, I really like your use of the opposites. The other one was good. Do you guys remember the other words you used? Contradiction. 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 Success and failure. Yeah. It's showing, it's, showing, it's, showing, it's showing your failure. It's showing that, you know, you, you might not be perfect. And, and the, the, the things you've been given is, is more, of more value in the sense that it helps you get, get to the next place. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because um, it's great to get it right the first time, but at the same time, you learn so much more when you fail. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and being able to know and learn more about yourself and throughout that process and getting to, you know, what you're trying to achieve. I think it's in other people's statements you're talking about. Um, kind of the, the idea that it's not so much the destination, but the journey. Um, the process of taking a picture, um, maybe even putting, you know, uh, your own filter on top of the world and seeing it in a different light. Um, that's kind of what I, I kind of heard from Robin's statement. It seems like, you know, like she's seeing things in a different way, and uh, you know, hopefully she can capture that in a way that other people will be able to to see and feel. You know, when you see her images. Um, 
Oh, so Jeff, uh, what I actually, my favorite part of your artist statement was freedom and failure. Because it's convenient that both of them are Fs. And it also evokes to me like a very military concept that like you're putting yourself like actually on the front lines. Like, you know, I think about, you guys watching me 300 Sparta? Yeah. Spot, this is Sparta, all right? So it's, um, it's really nice because I think in today's society, we all want to be free, but we're afraid of failure. So maybe, like, even from a philosophical perspective, you must not be afraid of free, uh, failure if you want freedom. So, like, yeah, if, if you said, like, your, your tagline was freedom and failure through art, that was, like, that would really catch my attention. That's very good. Okay? Edgar. Hi. I stand up. Hi. I'm Edgar. One, two, three. Hi, Hi Edgar. Edgar. I'm Edgar Lobel Photography, or, um, you know, from the Bay Area. Um, here's my artist thing, you know, my bio, it's, it, I've, I've had it since 180405, so I never changed in my bio. You know? 18 what? At 180405. 2005? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 1804, wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you look good for 200 yeah. and... It's like Highlander. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, now I'm in, you know, yeah. 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 I am a street photographer who loves taking photographs of the Bay Area. I choose to take photos of events of the nature around me. My photography means a lot to me. I enjoy going around Rockridge and Oakland with my cameras. I was taking, I, I am taking photos of moments uh, around me. I see images everywhere I go. I am always motivated to take my camera out and go into the world and create moments that last. And importance, importance and the world inspires me to see, wait, to see, to see stories around me. I see the world through my camera. And I'm not afraid to look dumb and look like I'm bigger than myself. And, and I, I love criticism. I love people criticizing my work. And I, I like the haters. I, I'm, I've been on YouTube for about three to four years. Um, Not to say that that's any big. I mean, everyone has their own story to tell. And I just, I like seeing Oakland as an opportunity to photograph everything around it because our, our, the way here is so diverse and so different. And I was raised here. I was born in San Mateo. Yeah. And, and it, 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 it means a lot to me to be here and to photograph here. And so what if I'm one of 100 million people taking photos? Um, to me, it, it, it's, it's a value for me if I tell my story, regardless of if it's well known or not. It, it's about showing who I am and what I see. And, and I came from nothing. I came from, or I came from something, but I came from a family that was alcoholics. And, um, and I was raised with two adopted lesbian parents. You know, I didn't have, I didn't see it like a general person would see it. I, I saw life as quirky, weird, funny, silly, awkward. And, you know, I'm awkward, and I'm not perfect. Like all of us, we're not perfect. And the art, the, you know, I, to me, it was just that I found myself through the lens and through a camera. And most people don't want to see themselves through a camera lens, mm. but I do. And I see that, you know, my aim just maybe not be spectacular. My videos might not be cool. But it, it tells a story to me. I look at it every day, go back on it, basically. Oh, really? Well, I think um, the parts I really latched on to what you shared, Edgar, is I'm not afraid. You guys know the Eminem song? I'm not afraid. Grab my Okay, so that, that's actually really good because to say that I'm not afraid is a very powerful statement. And also discovering yourself through the lens because raise your hand if you don't like to have photos taken of you. So I think actually... Um, so this is philosophy, okay? Whenever you're taking a picture that way, what actually it's doing is taking a photo this way. Is that you're actually revealing yourself through the pictures you take. So like, for example, if me and Brian are walking down the street in the mission, let's say I see a homeless dude with needles and I photograph him, but then Brian photographs colorful wall and kids playing around it, right? Technically, we see the same reality, but what we decide to photograph is essentially the filter in which we reveal our soul. And that's what I really want to encourage you guys to think about is that you're revealing your soul with others, 
in what you photograph because whenever you decide to click the shutter, you're revealing your social upbringing, you're revealing your personal interests, what you find beautiful, what you find ugly, and also you're revealing what you decide not to photograph. So in a sense, if you think about it, the camera should be used as a filter what is not important in reality. Because the reason why fisheye lenses never make for good pictures, you're showing too much, it's more important that you're getting close to whatever is really meaningful to you and just focus on that. It's a very nice idea. Okay? Give me a set up. All right. Brian. One, two, three. Hi, Brian. Look at that hair. That's my <laughs> part. <laughs> All right. Oops, hold on. Here we go. I'm a sucker for a good story, and I'm betting you are too. I devour yeah, I am. <laughs> I devour stories and snap and scrap my own. Here's a look at the beauty and the heartache of the world and the people on it. Can you hear their story and maybe glimpse your own? All right, I need to stand up and... Uh, have you, have you been poetry literature in the past? I have two creative writing degrees. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, it shows. That's I write good. For, I write for a living. So. Oh, that's, that's good. That's good. I mean, he does do freelance artist things. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> he accepts Bitcoin, <laughs> Ethereum, coffee, <laughs> coffee. Wait, translations wait. extra. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta take a step back. All right, that was pretty awesome. What do you guys like about that? It engages you to participate in the statement. Felt really real. Well, the cool thing too is that, like, I think this is the difficult thing in writing is. For you to reveal your soul while you're writing, you can actually hear the author's voice. So even if I read that on the screen, I'd be like, oh, that's Brian talking to me. Like, I can kind of get a flavor of who you are as a real person. And I think that's actually the best, <laughs> the best, uh, the best compliment I've ever been given in real life is that, oh, Eric, meeting you in real life and knowing you on the internet, you're the same person. I'm like, that's <laughs> quite possibly the nicest thing anyone can say. Because like, you're saying, Hey, this is who I am. I bet you're like me. Listen to me because this is important. Like, I like that. Like, it's confident without being asshole. <laughs> Which is, it's a very um, skillful thing to do. It's hard. I heard that, do you know what humor is? It's being able to make fun of somebody and have them laugh at themselves. Essentially. So, the fact that you're able to dance between these lines, that was really good. Man, I was just like, look, cayenne inside my paprika <laughs> mole sauce. That was good, right? Hello, I'm Philip. One, I'm two, three. Hi, Hi Philip. Uh, so this hard statement was written uh, to go along with a series that I'm doing, which the photographs have multiple layers. They may be reflections, but they're not necessarily reflections. But they're it's highly layered information. My photographs question perception and illustrate that reality is highly subjective and ambiguous. Although these single images are laid with visual information that hints at abstraction, they are not manipulated. It is their intent to make the viewer question what is real, what is constructed, and what is imagined. They seek to evoke an immersive emotional experience before the individual elements are considered. The making of these photographs is influenced by my subliminal mind, my past, and my emotions. They explore the transient nature of experience by describing an instant in a flux of time. Um, suggestion for your, your artist statement? Since you were, use the word subliminal, perhaps you should uh, also name drop other concepts according to Freud, like ego, id, subliminal. Uh, I actually don't know too much about Freud or subliminal thinking. Was that, was that Freud who really popularized the concept of the subliminal mind, or was that somebody else? Do you guys know? Oh, the unconscious. Oh, the unconscious. Because I, um, I think things that might be interesting for you to look into is do some more research on other scholars who have done research or poets on the unconscious subliminal mind, and to sprinkle in like concepts like ego, id, Freudian. <laughs> Anytime you mention something Freudian, Oh, at Berkeley, there's a just um, a student store. It has two, it has a uh, furry slippers with like a white guy's face on it with a beard. It is called Freudian slippers. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> yeah. You know the saying, Freudian slip is when you say something accidentally sexual about your mom without intending it. Oh, God. That's, that's what Freud thought everything was about your mom and how you wanted to go with her. <laughs> like Oedipus. And then you had a child. And then that child was not legitimate. <laughs> I can go on. Okay, everyone. Uh, was, that, was that everyone? Oh, Max. Oh, yeah, Max. One, oh, stand up. One, two, three. Hi, Hi Max. Max. All right, this is pretty straightforward. So as an engineer in my day job, I create, analyze, and fix man-made beautifully complex worlds made of zeros, ones, and logic. As an artist for a hobby, I try to extract and show the simple beauty of a natural world made of atoms, molecules, and centimeters. Oh, so beautiful! <laughs> Wait, what, what part do you guys like? The personal professional. It just it mirror, the statement mirrors itself. It's really, it's really clever. Somebody that writes that's a compliment. Yeah, very funny. I, um, oh, raise your hand if you're an engineer or in the sciences. Can you guys relate? Yes, absolutely. Which, which part, Jim, do you relate to? You did the contest that you show us. Like, which specific parts do you remember? Which, which parts are you seeing? Uh, I'm more stuck on the fact that you, you started off with I'm an engineer. I like that. Appreciate that. Why do you like that? Yeah, because I think what I liked is that the imagery of ones and zeros. I thought about the matrix, the kanji, right, uh, the uh, green code, right, and then to contrast that imagery with like molecules and flesh. And this is actually a good word to use, flesh, because um, it sounds sexual, but it's not. Technically, but it still evokes a very realness, visceral. very visceral. Oh, random. Um, I was studying image. All, so you know how Google has safe search to make sure you don't look at porn on accident. You turn that off before you're looking at stuff. Um, do you know how the algorithm actually knows whether something's not appropriate or not? There's an algorithm that weighs the number of the texture of human flesh in an image, which is actually quite interesting. Because there's algorithms that could effectively see what human skin texture looks like. Um, so yeah, the, the fact that you can see things from both sides, I think it's, it's really fantastic. Guys, did everyone go? Yeah, go club! Woo! Okay, so um, we're going to... Uh, nice, go club! black and white picture, and if you want to get rid of the shit in the background or distractions, add a very, very heavy vignette to the edges to help you put focus on the center. Or even in uh, Photoshop, or uh, sorry, Lightroom, there's something called the adjustment brush. So if you if you go into the develop module, in the hotkey for adjustment brush, I don't know why it's K, I think K for Eric Kim. If you want to adjust your picture, Eric Kim likes to adjust his pictures, press K. And you could use this little brush to darken certain parts of your picture like a painter. Some people will call this cheating, but people in the dark room have done this forever. And once again, if you see yourself as a painter of light, a photographer, everything's allowed. I'll show you guys how to do it later. But think adjustment brush, uh, vignettes. It's one of those things that like, it's kind of like spices for your food. You don't want to over season your food because sometimes if you make it too obvious, it looks cheesy. But I think in June's instances where the picture is already well lit in the center, Adding the heavy vignette or darkening crap in the background might be a good idea. Nice. Okay, so sorry, who's, uh, whose picture was the next one? <laughs> it is! <laughs> what did her face look like when she did it? Be gone, scum. Yeah. yeah. Right. So even when you're working on a photo project, right? Think about your pictures like links in, um, in a chain, and then the bottom you have a very one-ton ball. Even if you have one weak link, the whole thing falls apart. So, even if you have one weak picture in a series of images, all of it falls apart. I also call this the red sweater theory. Have you guys ever washed white clothes and someone threw in a red sweater? What happens? Everything's pink. Do you guys watch the Simpsons episode on that? Like 1992. So, what, right, so why is it not good to put have pink clothes? It ruins all the white ones, right? So, same thing in photography is that all your good pictures could be like white t-shirts, 
But if you just throw in one red sweater, which is the slightly weaker picture, it ruins the whole bunch. Or you know the saying, the rotten eggs... Yes. One rotten egg... It spoils a bunch. Apple. Or one, or one ro rotten apple... It spoils a bunch. It spoils all of them. Yeah. It's actually true. It is true. It's even true with uh, uh, people and friends. Sometimes having one negative person in your life could outweigh having 50 positive people in your life. So essentially, get rid of the weak links, and um, get rid of the rotten apples and the rotten eggs, right? So I look at these pictures, and they're all strong images, and they have the same concept. So all of you guys thinking forward, um, as, as when you're presenting your photographic work, it's very simple. Don't show weak photos. Even if, uh, I'll give you guys some practical tips, on your photography website, if you guys are not sure what to do, simple suggestions, limit your projects to three projects, Keep each project on your website, keep it limited to like 10 pictures, and only show your best. Very, very simple. Because I've had a lot of photographers, uh, I've judged a few photo contests where you get to submit up to five pictures. Some people lost because they just had one weak picture and five pictures. This one person, this is actually a very interesting part. You said upload up to five images. You didn't have to upload five pictures. When the person who actually won second place, they only uploaded three pictures, mm. but all the three pictures were very, very strong and also did as I said. And therefore, this person almost won grand prize. So the lesson of the story is, when in doubt, show fewer pictures, but make sure each photo is very, very strong. Mm. Nice. Golf club? All right. Who's the next? She looks like he's talking. Yeah. 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 So by having your lips a little bit open, it actually looks like the person is talking or they're breathing, so it actually has more life. You don't want to take pictures of people just going like this, or it's a little bit devoid of soul. Even if you look at like great paintings, they're always the lips, look at the lips, they're always a little bit open. That's why we always find the, you know you look like at fashion magazines, the girls look super weird, that all they look like this, they're all book tooth. <laughs> right? Oh, there's some fake tooth, yeah, lips. Yeah. But the reason that's interesting to look at is that it looks like they're talking to you. Because there's separation and lips are sexy, right? I think they're I think what I really appreciate is the very subtle repetition of semicircles uh, from the hairband to her bottom lip to her necklace to her cleavage of the purple. And then the gray tank. It's um, Ooh, nice and then the, the bottom of her breasts. It's just concentric one semicircle circle. concentric, and it, it just yeah, keeps circle. bringing you around and around and around. It's kind of makes it yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. great too. Yeah, you it, see it, how it makes you look you. at the whole yeah. thing over and over again. And the background's so clean too. Yeah. There's like no distraction in the background, which is very rare in this kind of city, right? That's really good. Nice golf clap. Figure to ground. So write this down, guys. Figure to ground. F I G U R E. Two space T O space ground. Ground like background. Figure to ground. The basic concept of figure to ground. You want your figure and the background to have separation. Second picture is a good picture in terms of the motion, but the reason why it's not as strong is that the figure to ground. It's a weak figure to ground because there's not enough separation between uh, the subjects in the background because the gray tones are too similar. Um, ways to fix this problem is if you shoot with a flash, you can separate the subjects or just try to ask the hands to move into the, right. the light. Right. Yeah. Um, the last picture is a lot better in terms of figure to ground because you can see the black tone, the gray tone, and the whiter tones. Um, well, I think what would make this shot a little bit stronger is I mean, it's very difficult because it's so crowded. If you just had one person walking down the avenue, then it'd be like a classic Cartier-Bresson composition with all the leading converging lines. If you just had one face or one head walking towards you or away from you, it would have been stronger. Nice. Golf club. Woo. Okay. Who's next? Apparently, they did this in drama classes. Is you have to act out a story with your partner, but while you're sitting down, everyone sit on top of your hand. So, up your hands. Uh, 
So, um, so let's begin this together. So sit on your hands. Everybody sit on their hands. Okay. And uh, describe uh, uh, what did you guys do today. So, Fabio, what did you do today? Learning. Where'd you go? Where? Where did you go? Yeah. Around. 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 Alex, what, when, during the teaching <laughs> session, <laughs> did you learn about your own pictures, pictures or other people's yes. pictures? Sorry, what did you learn about your pictures or other people's yeah. pictures? Yeah. Just getting to the point. Um, uh, and as kind of Harrison said, one of the things that's kind of reminded me to always you know, be looking at the edges before the center. Oh wow. Um, um, and. Uh, you know, uh, the, also the reminder around big, uh, you know, figure ground separation with uh, big value shifts, uh -huh. and sometimes it's hard to see with color and shapes. But just a little bit where like a hand is is like overlapping, you you lose the line of separation, mm -hmm. and that's such it's like this huge difference. It's like night and day, like a little sliver of. Yeah. <laughs> So George, what are some of the compositional elements you saw during the during the critique session that you liked? Uh, the, there was a wide variety. Yeah. Like most of them. Um, the, the separation. You the could separation. never see yeah. the, sep the subject is very seemed important to me. Um, the, the contrasting shapes, like the Bank of America building the sidewalk, was like this garbage can. So, uh, do you see what uh, he just did with his hands? He's using yeah, the hands yeah. to describe the thing. Somebody it's funny because when, uh, when he was talking, my hands, my fingers started twitching because I <laughs> wanted to also add to the same thing. So it's actually really integral that you're thinking about yeah. the hand gestures. Uh, what else what you guys, did you guys learn? Um, I learned that, that, that compositionally there's a lot of, there's a lot of leading lines in the, um, in the viewfinder, or like if you're on a digital viewfinder, and it just seeing that 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 shapes are and the lines are everywhere. So, how about Max? What uh, what did you learn about composition through the critique session? You did through your own pictures, other people's, or ideas you plan on integrating? Look at a picture, right? When you're looking at a picture, we usually tend to get tunnel vision, look in the center, right? I think the way the human eye sees. We could only actually see the inner 20% of a frame. That's the way human eye works, right? Oh, so, 50 millimeter. Yeah. So what you want to do is actually, when you're shooting, always look at the corners. Keep looking at the corners while you're shooting. And if you're shooting with clean corners, you'll actually make much better composition. So as a practice, get your car grab your camera. Alright, without moving, look up. See the the corners and the edges and the diagonals in the picture here. I'll give you guys a fun little activity or try. Try to photo make a photograph looking up at the ceiling, and to get all the diagonals, four diagonals coming out of all the corners of the frame. So, if I'm trying to photograph the corner of this picture here, you can see I have a, I have three corners. So you can see the picture I shot of this corner here. You see I have a corner here, a corner here, a corner here, but I need to get four corners. Yes. See if you could look up and try to photograph the ceiling where you get four corner lines Is it? to connect. Yes. Uh, coming, out of the, coming out of the corners of the frame. Oh. You want to check the corners only for leading lines. And so uh, this is actually a pretty good example. Actually, if you look at a lot of painting, so this is actually a shout out to Rand. So if you look at this Salvador Dali painting, right? Check the corners. What do you see about the corners? Do you guys see the leading lines? No. Do you guys see these lines coming directly from the corners? From the corners here. So by checking the corners, in an ideal row while you're shooting, you would try to get the, the corners of the frame to have the diagonals straight up. 
So while it is true that you can do this while cropping and post-processing afterwards, which is technically fine, I think it's actually more fun that while you're shooting a scene to try to integrate more corn. So a way I can do this, for example, so let's say I see this beautiful lady. Hello! Okay? <laughs> so you see this beautiful lady and oh, so concept too. Okay? So several ways I can do it, okay? So she's got her hands up there, like do the hands there. Do, do your hand thing again. Do hand motion. Hand up and the other one down again. So ways I can do this practically is that if you want to create a diagonal composition, you try to check this corner here to make sure that her hand's coming out of this corner here. And then the bottom right corner, I also try to check the corner here to make an engaging composition. So, for example, this would be a pretty good composition. This would be a pretty good composition. In the sense that if you look at the corner here, you have the diagonal going straight across here. But, I, but if you look at this picture, what's, what's wrong with this picture if you look at the background? A harsh brown line. So how can I simplify this picture? The worst thing, elbow. Yeah. <laughs> so how can I, how can I simplify this picture? <laughs> so uh, lift up your hands again. Sorry, not too. So, just it's your elbow. Very simple thing you guys can do. You're the worst thing in that picture. Very, very simple thing you guys can do. Very simple thing you guys can do is crouch down. Oh. Fine. And then you can keep trying to photograph Lord. Ooh, you're getting the third corner. Yep. So now, you guys see, right? Is the background cleaner? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, this is Much more dramatic before, mm -hmm. after. <laughs> yeah. yeah, less clutter. So, less clutter. And actually, yeah, like you said, I have the third corner. This is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, this is actually pretty good, too, because um, mm -hmm. Max, you're asking about negative space. Yeah. So, this is another good pro tip, actually, is that, the, in my opinion, the best way to integrate negative space, you want to imagine the viewer's, um, the subject's eye as a line, as an arrow. You want them to be looking towards the negative space. Because what this effectively does is it creates an imaginary line that connects to it. So for example, let's say I send this picture to Procreate. Effectively, whenever it comes to diagonals and composition, one of the best things is actually look at the direction in which people are looking. So for example, if we look at this beautiful lady here, I'll make this background black. So once again, if you check the corners, right? So, checking the corners. So, imagine when you're shooting, just have these corner markers here. So, if you look at the corners here, they look pretty good because you have this line that's going here, right? And also coming here. So, if I lower the opacity, you could see that, right? And now, this is the cool thing is that if you look at your subject, look at her eyes, right? The direction of her eyes are going. So she's essentially kind of looking towards that way-ish. Technically, if you really look, she's kind of more looking like here. But in the ideal direction, what you can even do is when you're directing your subject, this is good for fashion, pick up your hand like this and say, look here, so look at my hand. So you know what you can do is, let's say I'm photographing, right? Look at my hand. You see how her, you see how her eyes change. So look at my hand. Alright, it's a little hard. To see. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's say I'm, I'm looking at her. So look at my hand. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Totally. Right. So you can essentially that's actually a good way of directing a subject. But let's say she's kind of roughly looking this way, right? <coughs> this way. So now what you could figure out is that when you're looking at this picture, because her eye direction is going to the negative space, essentially visually what you've created is a very simple image that is, in terms of an abstract image, this is the, the movement you have in the frame. And even if I filter in as like 
just color. Let's say I just put this like a Matisse. And I fill this. You can see, right? Like now you start to deconstruct the image. This is essentially the image we made. So honestly, it's very difficult to see this while you're shooting, obviously. My practical suggestion is once again, while you're shooting a scene, you always try to simplify it. So even I'll, I'll even give you another light demo. So this is actually a fun idea. So look at my iPad. Where's the camera? So if I want to shoot from a lower angle, what can, where should the camera be? Down here, right? So you can, this is actually a pro tip for your iPhone, too. I can flip this bad boy. Like that. Now my camera is down here. So if I wanted to do the hand gesture thing again, by the way, yeah. if I wanted to get a better dynamic low angle, there we go. Now I could even do this. And then what you can even say is, hey, um, can you look up that way? Yeah, while I'm shooting, I'm checking the corners. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, even better, huh? You see the. Nice, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So what what shapes do you guys see? So you know, unfortunately, this is here, but you kind of get the sense, right? Is it, isn't it kind of insane that just shooting from a low angle can yeah. instantly simplify your pictures? And so now this is actually much better. So you can see the triangle here, the knees pointing here, like it's much more dynamic. So essentially, moral of the story is. One of the best ways to improve your composition is just to simplify it. Just shoot from a lower angle. That's very good. Okay. So, um, uh, take out your notebooks in the workshop so you, we can shoot a too long project. I look at a lot of pictures and judge other people's work all the time. Honestly, um, one of the best ways to make a strong impact or impression of the photographer is not just a single image, but a project. So the, the thing with a project is, um, what's your guys' favorite uh, book? Just book, just book, book. Favorite stories? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Raise your hand if you're a Harry Potter fan. Okay. Um, imagine if you read Harry Potter, but you only read one page. <laughs> Would you get the this magical universe of Harry Potter? No. So in a book, what do you have? Books, chapters, pages. The analogy is the pages are your pictures, and the chapters are sequences of images which pertain to a certain topic. So a very basic concept you could do in photography is Let's say you want to do, do a documentary project on what? Anyone have any project ideas? That's it. Street photography. Street photography, cool. So street photography, so let's say your book is street photography. If you wanted to create, let's say, um, five chapters, okay? The first chapter could be composed of uh, five images, which is street portraits. Then the next chapter is urban landscapes, five pictures. Then the next thing is, you know, Trash on the ground, five pictures. Then the next picture could be like, decisive moment, black and white people jump into a puddle or maybe. And also this is one thing that a lot of photographers do that actually works pretty well, that I actually don't see enough people doing, is if you put together a photo project of let's say 20 images, you're allowed to put in black slides that say chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. For some reason, and I look at the photographic world, the, photo the photograph world sucks. <laughs> They're all stupid. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> They're too trapped into this very insular way of thinking about photography, which is essentially dictated by Henri cartier Bresson, which is from the 1920s. It hasn't really evolved so much. I would actually say one of the best ways to think about photography projects, look at music, look at um, poetry, look at, um, look at movies. So, um, in a movie, if you watch a movie, what's, what's some of your favorite movies? Star Wars, okay? So in the big game Star Wars, what's the first scene? And what, what happens? The ship passes by. No, no, before oh, that. The text. It's a text. The text. The text. The text. 
You can start a photo project just showing text and describing what your project's about. There's some people who do photo projects, they just show the text in the first slide, describe what the project is, right? So what happens after the text in Star Wars? Battle scene. Battle scene. Boom. Action, right? Captivates your attention. Just kind of like um, Brian's uh, artist statement, is like, boom, punch him straight into the face, get them captivated. And then, you know, the story, the build up, and there's different variety of shots, right? So there's the wide shot, the close shot, the, the scene setting. So actually studying photography uh, projects, the best thing is to just study film and cinema. Because photography projects are generally not so well visually structured. When you watch movies, you see all the different variety of images. So even Alex mentioned there's this a book theory on editing. What's it called? No, what is it? The Putkin, the what's the name? Oh, uh, uh, the Battleship the Potemkin. Uh, uh, I, uh, Eisenstein. Uh, Eisenstein. Eisenstein. So write down Eisenstein. It's like Einstein, but Eisenstein. <laughs> Read uh, Google uh, Eisenstein PDF. Battleship Potemkin? Yeah, Battleship Potemkin. Yeah, Potemkin. Oh, no. no. It's a fake town. Potemkin Village. Yeah. So you'll essentially be able to study great cinema. Also, this is a good pro tip. The best thing is watch silent films, black and white silent films on YouTube. A lot of them are free. You'll essentially be able to understand how you can tell a story without any words or audio. Like, there's, there's this video on YouTube of, um, of uh, San Francisco, uh, you know on the cable car things? Uh, the, those on this tran trans transit center thing, and and having the um, the camera being pointed at the front, and going all the way up the block until you hit the um, the tower where the um, where the ferry building is, and that tells the story all the way down that that particular time and era, you know, 1940s is when that video was, and that was published in 2007 when people found the archives, and it's of the story of at that particular era. And you're like, man, I wish I lived in the 1920s. But to them, it was like also boring. It's like everyone has a top hat and a monocle. Like, it's so elementary, right? In our days, everyone's just looking at their phones, right? I mean, I, I agree, I hate shooting those pictures too. But maybe 50 years from now, when you have all the Google brain implant, whatever, it's like so retro, like <laughs> phones? <laughs> Come on, right? So. Don't feel like you've already missed out. Think that the pictures you shoot today and the projects you pursue today are going to be the future's history, and it's going to be very beneficial to society. Okay? Practical ideas for projects. So a lot of people often ask, that, oh, you know, what kind of photography project do I work on? This is my big advice here. Ask yourself, if I made this photo project and nobody else would ever see this project but myself, would I still shoot it? To me, this is the ultimate filter of whether it's worth doing or not because of this. The only way you can stay motivated to work on a project is that it's so meaningful to you that even though you don't have encouragement from other people, you'll still do it. Um, that's why I even think at the gym, you should have fun at the gym. Like, I like to do deadlifts and squats at the gym. And then a lot of my friends say, oh, I hate going to the gym, and so it sucks, whatever. But I'm like, I actually look forward to going to the gym. So, with exercise, physical activity, art, you have to be able to do it for the sake of enjoying to do it. And also has to be personal and show your soul. So I want to show you this project I worked on called Suits. I've been working on it for the last like maybe three, four years. And after I die, I want people to look at the pictures and be like, wow, you know. In 2018, when they still used monetary society after we all had the AI to eliminate monetary society, people still had to work at these jobs they hated just to make a living, and they thought that money could buy happiness. Ha ha ha, stupid humans from 2018, right? So, essentially, my practical suggestion for projects is this. Stick to one camera, one lens, one style of post-processing, and keep it consistent. It don't matter if you shoot with a phone, your digital camera, film, whatever, just keep it consistent. Because if you mix the aesthetic, often you get distracted. So this is why I don't like mixing black and white and color in the same project. Because imagine if you're watching Harry Potter and something goes black and white for half the film, you're like, what? Like, it's, it's what they call...
cognitive dissonance, which is a fancy word for cognitive you know, in the brain. Dissonance, which is like, it feels wrong or there's something distracting. So if you're looking through a photo project where you're mixing too many aesthetic and different things, there's cognitive dissonance that they lose attention on what your project's about. And they're more wondering, oh, I wonder why this photographer switched from something from color to black and white. Is there like some deeper attention that I'll know? And there might not be, and then it distracts me. But anyways, all these, yeah. So, so um, for a project like this or any yeah. other one, how far along in the taking of photographs did you decide that this would be a project? Oh, okay. Did you did you go out and like take the first one, or did you like take a few and then you're like, I'm interested? Okay, so that's that's a very good question. So um, I'll talk a very practical tip too. Um, I recommend everyone here to use Dropbox Pro. It's like ten bucks a month. It's probably been the best thing I personally invested my money on, and the reason is this: is that when you're working on a project, often you don't know what kind of projects you want to work on. This is my convention: is that I think it's good. Oh yeah, sorry. Spread your seed wide. When you're working on projects, you don't know what projects can be good. Work on many different projects at once, and eventually, what you're passionate enough about, you just keep doing it. And then the other projects that you stop doing, just let it die. That's actually good advice I got, is that like, there are some art projects which, it's okay to let it die. It's good. So this is what I do is, um, what, in my photography, so I have a pictures folder in Dropbox, I categorize it by year. And, Whenever I'm working on a photography project, I'll just do the name of the project, just working titles, and then just add a B number version, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then, this is the way I do it, is if I'm actually passionate about a project, you will naturally, this number will naturally go up, and the higher the number is, the more passionate I actually am about it. So Americans went for a very long time, and this is actually the fun thing, is that my suits project went up to fucking version 42. So even to show you version, I'll show you guys some like more outtakes. So this is what I often do is that I have different versions, right? And sometimes version, it, it's, it's totally loose, but some version 32, I'll just take all my old pictures that I like and I'll throw in some brand new ones. And then for version 33, I'll add certain photos to my um, sequence of images and I'll take away some. So, essentially these are just like, just to just kind of flip through a bunch of other images that I had, just some, because I'm not always sure like what I want to photograph and like, what constitutes a suit. <laughs> Actually with a flash, it's like what the fuck, why don't you sell me this guy? And then tying a shoe, I'm chatting with him afterwards. All men must die. So you can see, right, like, I'm obsessive enough about this project that I've pursued it for a long time. So inherently there must be some, so this is why it shows your photos live, right? Looks so serious, they just start laughing, right? And so you can see, if you're passionate enough about a project, just let your natural enthusiasm drive you. I don't, this is my new practical tip is that, if you're really passionate about a project, you shouldn't force yourself to work on it. Like, so what some photographers do, and artists do, is very unfortunate is this. They take a whip. Oh, I'm an artist. I'm like sacrificing myself for humanity, and I'm making this art that even though it's killing me, take photos, take photos. Oh, I can't motivate myself. Take photos. So it's, it's, it's not an authentic way to keep yourself motivated. I think it should actually be fun. Like, you know, even like... <laughs> Ah, <laughs> 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 yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah, so I just kind of like, so I kind of like it. The great thing about photographing has its suits, right? The number of punches in the face, because he has to be Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that's good. And you see crazy shit like this, it's like, it's insane, yeah. right? Yeah. And like, even, like, you know, details like this. So anyways, I've been working on the suits project for a long time, and I'm still working on it, it's still, to me, it's a... Uh, oh, actually, if you guys are interested, I think I might have a few books left, if you guys are interested. Um, but anyways, we published the first version, I'm sure in the future there'll be a suits version too. So that's kind of like a pre-edit, and this is like a tighter edit. So I'm, I'm at version 42. And I, this is my personal belief, I think less is more. Each, this is a practical tip when you're working on a project, each photo should be able to stand on its own two legs. And if the photo works within a series, it's double good. 
Because what some photographers do, which I don't like, they add filler. So you know Jack in the Box, they had the tacos? The day I discovered that wasn't meat, that was soy, I was so outraged. So put no soy in your uh, meat, okay? So this is like uh, an example of how I sequence the project. So you start off, and this is kind of like the stage thing. So what's, what's, what's unique about this guy? So what is the metaphor for this? Soulless corporate. Yeah. So everyone take the two fingers. Yeah. Hold the French right. What do you think is on his mind? Making money. Even this French fry doesn't bring me joy. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
checking my phone until I'm shooting the, the map. And then afterwards I say, oh, excuse me, mom, and then I picked it. And then I come back to my phone. So that's actually a good strategy is in terms of body gestures. If you want to shoot that close, don't be like, <laughs> don't be like, so once again, like take the camera with the flash, boom, flash, like straight in his face, and there's like, fucking tourist, right? And then after taking the picture, you hold up the camera and you go... And then, and then, wait, wait, stay there. And then, oh, it's just one. So, you kind of, so, ironically enough, that's actually one of the best ways to shoot. Even though, sorry, so stand up again. Even that tip too is that even when you're shooting street photography, let's say someone's in there, you go click, 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 click. So, oh, excuse me. It's like, and sometimes this is actually the ironic thing, is even if you're shooting click, 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 you go, and then, and you actually allow yourself to brush against the person to try to shoulder around them and keep clicking. 99.999% of people through your body language will assume you didn't do it. You're shooting behind them. Yes. Yeah. Or you can even do this. Awesome. Sorry, can, I, can you get by? No. You're kind of taking up the side. Yeah. So, once again, it's a lot of it is just like Jedi, Eric Kim's Jedi mind tricks, okay? Um, so, what is this a symbol of? So, I had no idea how I would sequence these. So, this is my uh, When you're working on a project, it's like a fucking jigsaw. Every time you take a picture, you're just capturing different puzzle pieces. And then afterwards, you gotta figure out how to put the puzzle together. And this is actually really difficult because there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's like poetry. Uh, you guys want to hear a funny new quote? Do you know what's the best way to annoy a poet? Explain his poetry to him. <laughs> so the, the same thing with photography too. Um, and honestly at this point, this is my big piece of advice. So when you're working on projects, um, I, I've, I've been doing this recently, like you can see here, pictures here, like, like portfolio. Every year, just update your portfolio. Like, I have pictures from 2014, 2017, like a bunch of these projects, right? And then 2018, I've changed it up, and some projects I've added new projects and new projects. And Ultimately, your strength as a photographer at this point, separate your pictures according to the projects you shoot. And you're allowed to experiment as much as you want. Just try to keep the project separate. Like, let me give you an example. So, like, this is my ongoing, like, street portrait series, right? All these pictures are shot Ricoh GR, 20 millimeter. <laughs> and then these pictures are literally shot, if this is my Rico, I'll pick up the Rico here. This picture is literally shot this close, in macro mode with flash. Because I'm not cropping, I'm filming the frame, right? Mission. This is just crazy. This guy died. This guy died a year after I photographed him. Yeah, this is like a homeless guy on the street that I chatted with. He said, um, you see super low angles. Who's the healer like? Do you guys remember the first 30 minutes of 30 seconds of the movie Up? Yeah. 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 So good. Yeah. yeah. So you can see, right? Like aesthetically, they all look similar because I shot them all with the Rico GR2, all vertical pictures. How do you decide black and white versus? Um, okay, so honestly, uh, that's that's actually a very good question. So all of these are in colors. These are all in colors. Obviously, so, this one with so much color. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like 
Uh, my, this is my suggestion, is whatever you enjoy doing, feel free, before, when you're first starting a project, experiment in color and black and white, just keep doing it, and then at a certain point you'll just kind of discover what works better for you, because like, for example, Because if you look, those are my color pictures, right? Now you look at my black and white photos of my, my Dark Skies Over Tokyo series. This is all shot with Rico. The setting's very different, right? So a lot of it, too, is seeing what kind of emotion are you trying to evoke through your images. I mean, the cliche is, but it's kind of true, that black and white generally evokes more timelessness, kind of like misery, mood, blah, 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 blah. And color is a little bit more vibrant and exuberant. What about the criticism that black and white is easy? Um, it's... I know it's not. Um, no, like no, no, people no, that's, say, that's oh, like, yeah, it's black and white. It's a good criticism, to be honest. I mean, this is the way I see it, is that... It's not even a matter of whether it's easy or not, because... I think good photography, it doesn't matter... Okay, so let me do your thing. There's some pictures that you'll shoot in life that were very easy to shoot, and they're phenomenal photos and really evoke the soul of the viewer. But there's other pictures that are very difficult to shoot, but the picture itself is not good. So it's not even a matter of whether it's an easy or difficult photo to shoot. It's more like, is it emotionally impactful or not? So, um, even with black and white, I think this is the thing, it's kind of like, it's kind of like chess, is, which you hand you not play chess? You can teach any child how to play chess in like five minutes, right? So the same thing with black and white is that you can teach people immediately how to shoot black and white, and they'll make pretty good pictures for the most part, because this simplifies, right? But if you want to become a grand master in chess, it's very difficult, right? So I think black and white is kind of the same thing. If I could use the analogy of a graph, is that the learning curve of uh, black and white is that when you start off, it's super easy. It's more simple and removes a lot of distractions. By the point where you want to become a really, really phenomenal grandmaster black and white, it gets very difficult. So it starts off super easy, 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 then really fucking hard to get through the black and So I think I'm at that point too, is that I start off in black and white, it was pretty easy, then when I try to take my black and white to the next level, it started getting very good. And to me, a greater black and white photo, it's even more simple and more elegant. And I also wanted to show you this in my project, it's titled, um, Memento Mori. Do you guys know what that means? Remember mortality. Remember mortality. Is that pictures that remind me that my loved ones will die and I'll also die. And that's the thing too, is the street photography aesthetic or approach can be applied to any type of photography you want to pursue. So, uh, anyone want to guess what this picture is? Korea. Korea? North Korea? I think you said it last time as well. Okay. So, guess who that lady is? My mother. <laughs> so, when my mom was a child during, like, after the Korean World War, this tiny plot of land, her and her four siblings lived in this tiny little plot of land, but the house belonged to this, right? And then, three years later, <laughs> so, it's very simple doing a diptych, just put two images together and make one JPEG image. Actually, can I comment on that? Something yeah. that Max said. I think one of the things is it's easier to put black and white in a series because it would be, depending on the lighting, it's harder to color match because like your white balance is very difficult. Like if you came back like, three years later at a different time of day, there's a good chance the colors would look very different. Yeah. But it, the black and white, they portrait. Show them the Rico DR2. Other. Oh, if you guys are curious about shooting black and white film, so look at this picture and look at this picture, right? They look actually quite different, right? Aesthetically. This is shot Rico DR version 2, process air came out of preset, just go go and get it free. This is shot Kodak Tri-X 1600, uh, 400 push to 1600 with the yellow filter. This is actually very interesting. So, Aesthetically, this is the brightest part. Do you notice that it's all still kind of gray? There's some gray here. 
And I think that's why aesthetically it looks nicer. Because even if you have the most advanced digital camera, the film still captures a lot better detail. So if you guys are interested in black and white film, this is kind of like the look of this end being it. But once again, capturing. And this is also one thing I wish I told myself earlier on too. You want a variety of pictures within this budget. So do you, do you guys know what this is? So it's soju. Do you know what this is? So this is my grandfather's gravesite. We're doing this. Do you know why we did this? What's in there? So I guess like my grandfather really liked the what do you call <laughs> the squid? So essentially, a lot of it too. When I was editing this project, it was just based on feel. Like what makes me feel like life and death? And these are kind of pictures that remind me of it. Also, other projects you work on. This is actually, to me, in my eyes, one of my back opuses. It's called Cindy Project. My Cindy. Photograph of Cindy. Hashtag Cindy. Hashtag Cindy Project. <laughs> so, um, you guys want to hear a sad story? We're ready. <laughs> you guys ready? Yeah. I have a really good friend, his name is Josh, he lives in Korea. He's a street photographer, he's had all the Leica cameras, he's probably spent $30,000 on camera equipment. And one day he gets a phone call from his mom, and it says you have to come back to Canada immediately. Something bad's happened. Jumps on a plane, comes back home. Found out his uh, dad uh, died. Yeah. He drowned in uh, a rafting accident. So you know that like, you go wild water rafting? So essentially the story is his mom and his dad, they're, both, they're actually both very good. One day he was unduly strong. Mom falls in, dad jumps in after her, saves her, puts her back in boat, but is so tired he just he dies. Okay. Very sad. So John, my buddy Josh is the photographer. And they say, okay, you gotta go to this funeral. I said, okay, let's find a nice picture of your dad and we'll put it on this altar. Let's see some later. Shit. I actually haven't taken that many pictures of my dad. And he has like all this crazy camera equipment. He was so distracted photographing more street photography than photographing his loved ones. And he essentially made that regret to me. Like, so essentially it taught me that like you should photograph your loved ones as diligently or far more diligently than you photograph strangers. Well, I have a thing. Yep. I get a comment. Why am I in it? Yes. So why is she so good? She does a uh, uh, large like uh, eight by ten photos. I mean, I, at four by four is like small for her, and this uh, she spent like the first half of her career actually photographing her family, her kids. She had three kids, and she actually created a lot of controversy because she's in, she's in the South. It's most of it's around her home, and her kids would just run naked in the summer. It's, <laughs> she was that, and the people were. Just outraged. Jesse Helms was outraged that the Americans were like the American tax money was going to photograph the kids. But she, a lot of this work I saw was shot with a 1800s uh, view camera, and she actually did the the Kaloida, um, process. She painted her her, her the glass herself, dipped it in the silver, developed it herself, and she actually. Use the uh, uh, perfection, imperfections in this process as part of her work. And the, the prints are, there's a prints are about like this, but then the negatives like this are just mind blowing. And also, the great thing too is that for her first career, the reason she got paid, she just photographed family members, her kids. Yeah. Because you know, like, so, we should have your kids. So, you know, like, some people are like, oh, you know, like, I want to go to India. Like, Vietnam and photograph people there because it's so exotic and interesting, right? But once again, don't get suckered by the exotic. You can just photograph your loved ones, your, your friends, your family members. And so she essentially made really beautiful photos of her loved ones. So similarly, I was like, I have this great subject, this beautiful lady named Cindy. What if I take pictures of her, right? So you can see, right? Simple compositional things like leaning lights. She's like, Eric, let's get a coffee. It's like, Eric, and then click. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Anyone yeah. ever do the, the four or five, uh, the yeah. five drive up to NorCal? Yeah. Up yeah. Down. Uh, do, you know, do you know what stop this is? Kettleman. Kettleman. Kettleman yeah. City. Yeah. 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 This is so iconic, just the way it, it, it makes me think of a Hollywood shot. Oh, why? Because it's like. Hey. Yeah. And it's kind of nice too because I'm sure things down the line it's like historians probably calculate how cheap cast was back like then. Yeah. And you can see right the street photography technique, selfie, or yeah. Prius, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you look like a celebrity in there. Oh, that's what yeah. 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 you say. You tell that studio to screw up. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she, she's the boss. Cindy uh, <laughs> likes to come out of there. Stop, paparazzi! Yeah. Sorry. So, this is also nice too because this is. Um, we're not shooting it, we're just. This 2015, we're shooting wow. really in our Berkeley bar apartment. Yeah. And even simple things that you don't realize about. Like all these things on our. Well, here, I actually remember a lot of these things, and I forgot about it. Um, it sets a, it's a statement in time. Like, there's there's ways to make images not set in time, and then these are, like, set in time. Like, yeah. That early 2000s or 20, yeah. whatever this was shot. Uh, they were, my grandparents were making letters to me as I was adopted in the same sort of concept. And now everyone's doing it on email. As, as I got older, she started doing it on email. And then, yeah, it's a, it puts a time limit on it. So you're going to be happy that you made personal photos of your loved ones, yeah. your family, even your home, because let's say you take pictures in your like um, your your shoebox apartment in SF, yeah. you might not be living there like two years from now. Uh -huh. You probably actually won't, right? You'll be happy you did because you know we got the. You know, I never use the IKEA foldout couch bed. Yeah. It's amazing. No one buys those anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was, was that one you played? Oh, I was tracing. You can see, right? Yeah, like, when I'm taking the pictures, I really try to... And so, it sounds so cheesy, but shoot with your soul or shoot with your heart. If you see something, when you feel something in your heart, just wait. This is very simple. I was having breakfast. I was having breakfast with Cindy in the Berkeley. I was talking to Cindy, drinking my water, and I said, "Oh, if you look at somebody through the glass here, it actually looks kind of funny." So I took my Rico, took about 50 pictures. Oh, Cindy, hold that. Click, 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 click. click. Yeah. But um, what do you think this photo is a metaphor for? How does it make you feel? Weary, like busy, busy, like hung over, sorry. So this is Cindy in dissertation mode. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. And a lot of photographers don't like to put their selfie in the picture, but I'm like, why not? Like, you put your, that's literally putting your soul in the picture. Yeah. You remember the bookend technique, right? Yeah. And this is one thing that's why it's good to watch cinema. They always do this kind of shot, right? The over the shoulder shot. Yeah. So like, if you're standing up, Mark, pretend to look like Cindy. <laughs> and no hope. You're looking at Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would yeah. never do that. Uh, I, was like, like, <laughs> I was literally shooting like this. Uh -huh. So I was shooting over her shoulder while she's looking into the mirror. Yeah. So I was able to get her outline here in the foreground, but I put the focus on the mirror. On the mirror. Yeah. Ask her to brush the hair back and forth a few times. You can see it. Yeah. We're just going, we're leaving an apartment in uh, Hanoi. We're in the elevator. Say, oh, can you look up? Do you guys see the arabesque? Yeah. yeah. Yes. This is another pro tip. If you're photographing your loved one, you can direct it. Look up towards the light. Do you know what happens to the eyes? Catch lights. Catch lights. Yeah. It's very simple. You just tell people to look up to the lights. Yeah, I saw it there. And you'll get the epicness of the eyes. Right? Remember, simple separation. Once again, try to get that separation. Yeah. This is us in the hotel room. This is also another idea for if you, if you sleep in the same bed as your partner. Do a project where every time you wake up in the morning, just take a picture of your bed. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm just shooting here. I had her in the foreground. Do you guys see the triangle composition? Yeah. I see that. This triangle here. And you see her, her mom is kind of like facing this way, so it kind of adds motion here. Just kind of looking back at you. And then you also see the triangle here, right? And then this is a very rare case. I got two good pictures in the same scene. Because I really like this one and this one too. Same time, but shooting color. Oh. Our Asians are. What is this? What is it? Gross. <laughs> Very what surreal. Right? Huh? What is it for? Huh? It's good for something. It's for different purposes, but usually for pain. I see. Wow. <laughs> what is that? Do you know what it is? <laughs> 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 Oh. I actually photographed somebody yesterday wow. that was carrying one like this. <laughs> so you can see, right, like the the color photos have a different feel, right? Different vibe. They're kind of more like fun and upbeat. Kind of more funky. Just simple things, right? Like I was out shooting with her. Now this is a nice thing. When you shoot color, I actually look for color. She's wearing a blue romper which got stolen in the car. <laughs> And then we're outside of Goodwill. We're outside of Goodwill. And the oh, Cindy, can you stand here? She's like, okay. And then, and I speak to her. Good fashion photography. Yeah. In the mirror, asking people to do it around. It's good. Standing in front of there. So you can see there's so many different types of photo projects you guys could work on. But generally, my, pro my suggestion is this when you're working on projects, work on projects which are really meaningful to you. And get some sort of critique or commentary on the world. So like this is like my America project. Just all shot 35 millimeter Kodak portrait format film. Uh, and it's kind of like creepy. You can see like pause. And on a piece of paper, ask yourself, why am I doing this? If it's meaningful enough to you, you'll continue. If you lose passion for it, it's okay to let it die. Move on. Also, other practical things too. A lot of these projects have taken me like two or three years. And trust me, when I started these projects, I was like, I'm like, man, can I really shoot a project for two or three years? I'm like, I'm like, I don't have the patience for that. Fucking two or three years goes by like that. You guys remember the last two or three years of your life? Just like that. So recognize in photography, the same thing applies as that. The projects you start today, before you know it, it'll be two or three years later. Also, other practical tips too, um, when you're editing a project, when in doubt, ditch the picture. I call this the Eric Kim's uh, milk test strategy. You ever open up a, you ever open up milk? Do you guys ever open up the, the fridge, right? And then there's like, a gallon of milk. In that situation, should you drink it or not? No. no. Has anyone ever tried to do the opposite? When I was a pro college student, yes? <laughs> right, so, when in doubt, if you look at a picture, and you're like, not sure if it's good or not, it's not a good picture. Your life is long. There's going to be a million, especially with digital photos in our phones, 
you have a million photos waiting to be shot, you're going to make better photos. So when in doubt, just throw it out. Um, also, uh, I use my marinating wine analogy. So raise your hand if you're a wino. So what are you supposed to do with wine? <laughs> Drink it, but uh, uh, let it uh, let it not uh, aerate or oxidize the wine. Yeah. Yeah. So generally, with wine, the older it gets, the better it tastes. So sometimes, if you're not sure if a photo project is good or not, just keep it in Dropbox or keep it on your computer, and then a week later, a month later, a year later, go back to it and just ask yourself, do I still like it? Because sometimes photos you've taken a year ago that you thought were great, a year later it's not so good. It's like, um, they say this in writing, write a novel, lock it into a drawer, leave it there, come back a year later, reread it, it's like, then you figure out how to edit it. Because sometimes, you need um, time. You become too emotionally attached to your work that you cannot see it objectively. So, uh, I have a question. You guys ever go on Facebook and see photos of your kids' friends on Facebook? Yeah. Have you ever had your friend come, oh, isn't that my kid so cute in your life? Uh, oh, <laughs> Sometimes you like to wash it first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially when like the hand is cropped right here. Yeah, I'm like, like, oh, I'm like oh, maybe you should maybe you should put that back in the oven. Like, <laughs> so okay. to a parent. <laughs> All of your kids are so beautiful and smart and talented and beautiful and smart, right? But when outside you see your baby, our pictures are like our children. When you take pictures and you create them, you're essentially giving birth to your own children. It's really hard to be negative towards your own pictures. So what I do think is sometimes the best thing is just time. So even like what I recommend is if you go out and you shoot pictures, before you know whether it's a good picture or not, just wait a few days, wait a week, wait a month. For me, often if I know if a good picture is good or not, is at least a year, to be honest. And so sometimes what I even do is photos from 2017 from last year that I thought were good pictures, I go back to them. And if I still think they're good, I still I reshare. So this is another thing too, it's okay to reshare old work. If anything, if you looked at a picture that I shot eight years ago and you, it's still good, Perhaps you should still reshare it because people might have not seen it too. Hashtag but, throwback. Yeah. Hashtag throwback. Yeah. Uh, and also with projects too, another way to do it, you can just go out and just shoot random shit and figure out what to do with it afterwards. So this is another tip too, what some photographers do, is that, let's say you shoot random photos for a year, all over the place, like color, black and white, food, street, whatever, just at the end of the year sit down, create folders on your laptop that say street, black and white street, color street, food, dogs, whatever, and just start moving the, the the things into the different folders, and then see, have I discovered a project yet? Because you might be working on a project and might not even know about it. So, uh, and I think this strategy works well too. So there's so, so essentially what I want, really want to tell you guys about projects is that there's no right way to work on a project, and you don't even have to work on a project. Often working on a project is nice because it just gives you some focus. But if you're just like you just like to take pictures, that's okay too. But I still do recommend you that if you have a website portfolio and decide to share your work, keep it well curated to your best. Best is less. Oh, how many images do you think? Oh, print format. Cindy does history of the book, so. Okay, there's a lot of ways. Okay, so print portfolio, you can do photo album, which we mentioned before, right? Yeah. yeah. Photo album, you could even cut kind of print. You could do a photo collage, you could kind of print a poster kind of thing. You can print. Um, we've done a lot of triptychs, which are three photos next to each other, and then you can kind of fold into a trifold, and then so then you can just it up, that's it. You can print out anything, like notebooks, shirts, I mean, you can print Yeah, you can print sure. Up. Adobe has this cool Spark thing where you can do these, like, running, like, photo, online photo photos. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, yeah, check out Adobe Spark. Um, ultimately, this is one thing I've discovered, is that, like, back in the day, Spark. I used to want to be, like, Spark. taken as a serious, respectable, dignified photographer. Like, 
your boss make a photo book and go to an exhibition and a gallery and grow a beard and have a monocle. Like, the old school way of doing photography is dead. The only reason they did that was that was the only option they had. There's so many new exciting options with digital. Don't be a slave to any. You can do both. You can do online, digital, print, whatever. Just know that you have so many options. And just because you're just only a digital photographer doesn't make your work any less valuable. No, trust me, the art world is like this. <laughs> you're not trying to impress these snobby people who wait who know way too much about stupid stuff. You're trying to impress yourself and also the small community. So, everyone stand up. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, how do you know that you're important? Okay, that's actually a very good question. Uh, like, for instance, your experience. Was it because okay. people started wanting to take your workshop? Yeah, that's actually more good video. That's actually a very good question. So, I'm looking for well, Street Photography 2017, right? Now, look at the picture. If, this is my tip make a decision in less than a second. It's either keep or ditch. So I look at this, I'm like, okay, keep. And then what I'll do is I'll push it, I'll resave it to my camera roll. Right, this is good. Yep, keep, good. I shot this in 2009. I'm like, yeah, I don't really like it that much anymore. And because like, five years ago, I'll be so attached, I'm like, oh, it's such a nice picture. I look at it, I'm like, man, on to the next one. This one's still pretty good. Save it. And literally, I'll go through it by their pictures and see it. Oh, look at this picture. I'm like, man, this is. I shot this uh, one or two years ago in Hanoi. I still look at the but This is when you know you got a good photo. You look at a photo and you're like, damn, that's a good picture. I start looking at I'm like, damn, that's a good picture. I'm like, I wish I shot that. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So I like these pictures. So just look at your pictures from a year ago, and I'm like, hmm, am I. Am I improving or not? And if you feel like you're not, oh, these are these are pictures of mine. So even like abstract pictures. Oh, so this is another good example too. I started shooting abstract photos for fun, but I was kind of worried or self-conscious that people wanted to be as a serious photographer. So I kept them mostly offline for about two or three years. And then once I had the courage, I'm like, you know what? I'm not just gonna be a street photographer, I'm just gonna be a whatever photographer and I upload them. Oh, they're nice, I like this, so I'm push and hold it here. So a lot of it is just having courage to shoot whatever. It's like, oh, this is so good. Anyone see a face there? It's kind of like abstract. So that's cool. This one's still pretty good, nice and simple. So just kind of look through your photos one by one. And then just kind of re-export them or re-save them. I'm like, like even this picture, people are like, what are you now, like a plant photographer? And I'm like, it's kind of like my air cam high contrast black my repo setting. But yeah, some people might love these pictures, like it doesn't look like I, I photographed them. But I still like them. And maybe that's perhaps a way to know if you're evolving or changing or not, is that you look at your own pictures and you're like, huh, maybe a past Max wouldn't have photographed this, but I'm interested in now. And maybe it's because I've been looking at a lot of Rothko and Impressionist painters and stuff like that. So your your vision, your taste evolves. It's kind of like, uh, anyone here likes to cook? Are there certain foods that you really liked like five years ago that you don't like anymore? Kind of the same thing, right? Like, you know, kimchi fried rice and cup noodles. Great in college. Now, uh, not so much, if I have an option. Other questions? A project, style, long term, motivation, marketing.